All right, I think uh, we'll call the meeting to order. And uh, before I do that, just a, uh, a couple of uh, comments. This is a first time for this committee uh, with respect to the actual structure of the uh, committee meeting this time. Uh, other than myself and uh, our recording secretary, everyone else is on uh, remote. So um, I would suggest that uh, everyone be patient. Um, I will be taking my time, probably uh, quite a few pauses as we go through this, because at times there are delays uh, with respect to the uh, technology. And we also have some folks that will be reporting in today by phone, uh, telephone. So that being the case, it's probably going to uh, slow us down a little bit. But hey, we've been uh, through this before um, in a different process, but uh, I'm sure we'll do uh, just fine. And I, I guess I would ask that I'm going to be, I'm be, I've been told to leave my mic on, so I'll try not to uh, do anything silly. Uh, or whatever, <laughs> but um, so uh, I'll be, as they say, I'll be live uh, most of the time. Uh, please take your time and speak uh, slowly uh, so that we can understand because as the committee members especially well know that we do have time uh, problems sometimes with the audio, so I would appreciate it if you'd uh, take your time and uh, we'll get through this with no problems at all. So as indicated, I've called the meeting to order. As required under the Planning Act, a public meeting is being held prior to the committee making a decision on these applications. And first of all, I will introduce the members. I might as well start with me, seeing as how I'm live here. So uh, my name is uh, Mr. Robertson, uh, and I'm actually at City Hall. Um, and our members remotely are uh, Ms. Richardson, Ms. Archer, Mr. Strangway, Councillor Yo. All right. And we have uh, staff remotely. We have, uh, and uh, congratulations to uh, Mr. Halling, Acting Director of uh, Development Services. Great choice, in my opinion, Richard. And uh, we also have remotely the uh, new Acting Manager. Congratulations to uh, Leah Berry. Uh, she's the Acting Manager of Planning. And we have, I'm told David Harding is not here today, so Planner 2, uh, Mr. Stainton. And we have the Acting Secretary Treasurer, Mr. Leahy. Our Chief Building Official, I'm told uh, Ms. Murchison is online. And uh, Ms. Sisson, Supervisor of Development and Engineering. Thank you. And a very important person here with me is our Recording Secretary, Ms. Crawford. <clears throat> Alrighty. All right, having said all that and confused everyone, uh, can I get a motion to approve the agenda as printed? All right, I see Mr. Strangway's hand, Councillor Yo's hand. All right. All those in favor, can I see your hands for that part of it? Okay, that carries. Thank you. All right, are there any declarations of pecuniary interest by members of the committee? All right, I don't see any hands, so the minutes of the last meeting. Are there any comments or questions with respect to the minutes of the last meeting? All right, that being the case, can I get a motion to adopt the minutes as printed? Ms. Archer, Ms. Richardson, no further comments or questions. All those in favor? And that carries, all right. Now I've been advised just for members of the committee that probably the best way to do this with respect to the applications is ask for a recorded vote. So I will uh, be doing uh, that for the, uh, the applications. Did I see your hand there, uh, Mr. Holly? No? All right. All right. For the benefit of everyone that's on remote there, the committee will hear comments, gather information, and may ask questions to clarify statements made. The committee may ask and answer questions or redirect questions to the appropriate person. Please note that any information or comments given to the committee during this meeting, they are considered evidence. We will first hear from staff, then the applicant or his or her agent. 
We will then hear from any person in support of or from those who have questions, concerns, or are opposed to the application. Finally, the applicant or his or her agent will have an opportunity to respond to any of the statements made to the committee. And starting off, and I believe Mr. Stanton, you'll be, uh, you'll be handling this one as well. This is file number D03-2020-006. It's 114 Queen Street, former town of Lindsay. Go ahead, Mr. Stanton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would actually like to point out that uh, Mr. Hawley will be the individual overseeing this file today. Thank you. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Stanton. Um, yes, I will be uh, presenting this file uh, today, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, Mr. Uh, Hawley. So this application is a consent application. Uh, it proposes to sever an approximately 300 square meter uh, residential lot at the north end of the property. Uh, and retain approximately a 564 square foot uh, lot, which contains a single detached dwelling on it. Um, the property is rectangular in size. And so the, the southern uh, roughly two thirds would be retained and the, the northern part would be severed off. Uh, the severed lands, um, the intention is to construct a single detached dwelling on that property. <clears throat> the applicant is Jeffrey Farquhar. Uh, the official plan designation is residential commercial within the mixed use uh, corridor policy area. Uh, the zoning for the property is mixed residential commercial. <clears throat> and the property is just over a thousand square meters in size. It is currently serviced by municipal water uh, and sanitary sewer as well as storm sewer. In general, the application conforms to the uh, 2020 provincial policy statement. Uh, the development uh, provides for further intensification. Uh, it directs additional residential development and intensification into our urban, uh, into our urban settlement area um, and provides an additional mix of housing from that perspective. Uh, it, al it also uh, further utilizes our full municipal urban services. From that perspective, the proposal uh, uh, complies with the uh, 2020 provincial policy statement. Uh, a, similar, a similar argument can be made for the, for the uh, 2019 growth plan. Again, the same principles apply. The application provides for a range of housing. Uh, the retained lands, which is the, the house at the south end, uh, could be retained and could also, within the policy framework of the mixed-use residential uh, policies, could potentially uh, convert to either a mixed-use or a commercial uh, building. So, in all likelihood, it wouldn't be a heavy commercial. It would be likely an office or a, a small retail shop. Uh, from that perspective, the proposal conforms to the growth plan. Um, similarly, the, the, uh, the application also uh, uh, conforms with the Town of Lindsay uh, official plan. Um, as the Lindsay secondary plan is not enforced yet, we go to the uh, Town of Lindsay official plan uh, for our policies. Uh, the policy, this is part of a um, essentially a, a a conversion area where the policies uh, encourage some of the residential uses along that street to uh, to convert to either commercial use or a mixed use um, type of uh, type of development with ground floor commercial and second story residential. Uh, so from that perspective, it does uh, conform to the official plan. Um, there are also policies in the, in the official plan uh, that um, require us to ask for road widenings. Um, so the city is asking for a three meter road widening along St. David Street, a three meter road widening along Queen Street, as well as a site triangle within um, at the intersection of Queen Street and St. David Street. And that is to accommodate future uh, road upgrades that are contemplated uh, from a long-term perspective in our uh, transportation master plan. 
Moving on to the zoning bylaw, the, the property is zoned uh, mixed residential commercial, which allows a variety of low intensity commercial uses, as well as residential uses. The, the severed lot, because it is severed off and it is a standalone residential use, although it's zoned mixed use residential commercial, would be the applicable uh, residential zone poly, uh, standards would then apply. The, the applicant is, has on the sketch that was uh, sent to us, the applicant is showing approximately 564 square meters of retained land. Um, part of the part of what um, is is in, is is important for staff is that there is sufficient land left over on the retained land, so the, there's a possibility that it could convert to either a mixed commercial uh, residential development or a commercial development. Uh, those are comments that we had received from our economic development department. So we are trying to implement those, uh, the comments. Um, there, there would be sufficient land uh, left over with the retained parcel uh, so that parking could be accommodated on that property to allow for the, uh, the dwelling to convert to um, commercial uses. So from that perspective, it, it does comply with the intent of the zoning as well. Um, there, will be, uh, there will be a need for a minor variance that is associated with the retained lands because the minimum lot size under the MRC zone is 600 square meters and the applicant is currently showing 564. So one of the conditions of the consent uh, would be a minor variance for the retained uh, lands to deal with the, the reduced lot area. Um, we feel that there's probably going to be sufficient parking, so we might, I don't think we would need a, a variance for that. Uh, there would also need to be a variance uh, considered for the severed lot. Um, if you take a look at the, the sketch, it shows the, the residential portion of the uh, or the building portion quite close to the uh, to the new front lot line. It's probably about two meters away, so we would need to uh, deal with a minor variance for at least front uh, front yard setbacks, and there may be other aspects to it. Um, the applicant is aware of that and would be uh, submitting a minor variance application um, fairly soon, so that they can get on to the next uh, available agenda to deal with these issues. So from our perspective, it does conform to the official plan, provincial policy, and it meets the intent of the Town of Lindsay zoning bylaw as well. Um, we did get comments back from community services. They request a 5% cash in lieu of uh, parkland, uh, which would be taken for the newly severed land. Uh, building division has, um, has no concerns. Uh, economic development, um, as previously indicated, they one of their goals from their strategy is to allow have sufficient land associated with this property to allow for a conversion to uh, commercial uses. From our perspective, we feel that we've um, fulfilled that comment. Um, the engineering department has no concerns, provided that road widenings are taken. Three meter road widening is taken on St. David Street. Three meter road widening is taken on Queen Street and a site triangle, I believe it's a 12 by 12 taken at the intersection of those two, um, of those two roads. Uh, we did get some comments uh, from John and Linda McCauley. Um, they were concerned with respect to the severance and their comments are contained in, the, uh, in our comments. Please excuse me. I'm just I'm just sort of going through the report just to see if there's anything else I need to pull out. Um, let 
No, um, Mr. Chair and, and committee, I believe that's that's all the relevant information that uh, that's in the report that I've presented. Uh, from staff's perspective, uh, we do recommend that the application is approved. I do wish to state to the committee that um, I've had some very lengthy conversations with Mr. Farquhar over the past couple of days, and um, he will likely be speaking to those conversations uh, later on. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Holly. Are there any questions of Mr. Holly from the committee? <clears throat> yes, Ms. Archer, go ahead. I believe you touched on this when you gave your presentation, but the, the lot that is going to be severed, will it stay as a mixed residential commercial or should it be rezoned to just, just residential? Through the chair to uh, Member Archer, the. The MRC zone has a provision that allows it to stay as a residential, as an MRC zone, but if it's used as a residential uh, in accordance with an R1 or R2 or 3 zone, uh, you don't need to rezone. We just automatically refer to those zone, uh, zone requirements. So there, from a staff perspective, there is no need to, uh, we don't feel there's a need to rezone to, uh, the property. It would simply add an extra layer that we don't necessarily feel is is required. So leaving it as the MR or mixed residential commercial, there's no possibility the new owners could open up a grocery store. Um, no, because a grocery store isn't permitted. First of all, and second of all, um, there isn't enough room to accommodate parking or to accommodate the use. So it it is a um, it is a site and it's a lot that's purposely sized for residential use, and that's really all it can be used for. And because there is a provision in the MRC zoning that allows this to happen, we feel that it's it's covered off from that perspective. Thank you. Yeah, Mr. Schrangway, go ahead. Um, further to the road widening in the site triangle, I'm just wondering, does that apply to both the new severed lot or the original lot as well? Through the chair to Member Strangway, it applies to both the severed and the retained lands. Um, we did get a legal opinion on that uh, just fresh uh, about a week ago. It does apply on, to both the severed and the retained lands. Um, and so that's why we're asking for uh, the widening on both on both pieces, as well as the widening on Queen Street. Uh, further follow up: Are there any plans to widen it, either of these streets now or in the near future? Uh, through the chair, I'm not aware of that, but perhaps I would let um, Christina Sisson, uh, the engineering department, speak to that matter. All right. Ms. Sisson, are you uh, there? Yes, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, the arterial and collector roads have been identified in the official plans for several years, in fact, decades now. So it's our understanding in the transportation master plan that at any time, either of these roads could be widened and that would be predicated on the specific growth and development targets that are necessary for those widenings. They have been identified as the corridors through and around the Lindsay area to both the residential components and the industrial commercial areas as well. So Thanks. the widenings so are required for the future use, but at this particular time, neither of those projects is on a current capital projection for next year, if that's, if, if that's the question. It is, thanks. Um, so there's nothing in the immediate future that's on the books right now for that. Correct, that's my understanding. And the other residents uh, along those streets, um, is there any sort of uh, accommodation to, to widen the road with respect to those residents? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> When we proceed with a capital project, and it typically does involve the, it can involve the environmental assessment process, but typically through that process, we would identify what our needs are. Sometimes that can be sidewalks on both sides of the road. Sometimes it can be additional infrastructure. Sometimes it can be the actual lane width 
or the number of lanes that are required for that road structure. Um, we are currently going through a process, for instance, in Fenland Falls, whereby, again, through any of the planning applications that we can, be it a, a site plan, a consent or severance, or the subdivision process, if there's an ability for us to take those lands, then it's considered in the best interest of the municipality to take those through that process. Otherwise, we would be in a position where we would have to expropriate, and so appropriate letters would go out to those residents at that time for those particular needs. Sometimes as a result of the uh, construction of the road and or the design of the road, et cetera, properties are already encroaching on the road allowance, and then sometimes an encroachment agreement can be reached, and sometimes it can mean other factors. Okay. But we do understand that there are existing situations and that does challenge when we move forward. Okay, thank you for that. I'll, I'll hold my further questions right now, thanks. Further questions to the planner? Councillor Yo, go ahead. Thank you and um, through you, Mr. Chair, I thought Steve's questions were gonna keep going um, because in if I'm reading the uh, applicant's letter, he, he talks about the Planning Act and um, and not being allowed to go through uh, existing buildings and stuff. Could you, could you comment on that, please? Because obviously the three meters and the 12 meter triangle would be going through existing buildings as it stands now. Ms. Sisson, go ahead. I will defer to Richard Hawley as I believe he was looking at this particular item and had some comments. Thank you, Mr. Hawley, go ahead. Yes, to the chair, to the councillor. Yes, that's correct. Um, we would not be taking the land underneath the building. We would likely take the land around the building and we'd probably uh, leave a strip around the building uh, so that the building foundations wouldn't, and come, wouldn't encroach into the road allowance. So we would leave a small buffer around the edge of the foundation so that, uh, so that the building would not encroach into the city's right of way. Uh, the Planning Act does not allow us to take land underneath buildings as part of widenings. Uh, so we would we would essentially take the land, uh, save and accept what what actually goes underneath the building. Uh, we would take that as widenings or as site triangles. And and so a follow up if I could. So the conditions on the consent and the application would uh, would speak to that. There. So we had put in uh, we had put in two different sets of conditions. One that went underneath the land, subject to an encroachment agreement, and then one that went around the land, around the buildings. We would only enforce in the conditions. We would only take uh, land as it goes around the buildings. We wouldn't take it underneath the buildings. Thank you. Further questions of the planner. Uh, Ms. Richardson, go ahead. So does the city, <clears throat> excuse me, does the city currently own all of the required road allowance for further expansion all along King or St. David and Queen? Or would you have to expropriate if ever you were going to do the road widening? Through the chair, um, we would only own widenings that we had taken through a previous either a site plan a consent or a <clears throat> staff plan a subdivision um i'm not 100 percent sure how much additional land we own along either uh queen street or st david street um but you know once those capital projects as Ms. assistant said once those capital projects start to get activated there is a a, a land acquisition phase that goes that goes along with that and we go along and uh, purchase all the properties um, along the entire corridor in accordance with the design that is approved uh, through the EA process. But to answer your question, I'm not, I'm not sure how many properties we currently own through there. A follow up. Go ahead. Um, how wide is Queen Street currently and how wide is St. David Street currently? Through the chair, um, I sus I'm not 100% sure how wide those streets are. Uh, perhaps uh, Ms. Sisson can answer that uh, question. 
Ms. Sisson, uh, go ahead. You, thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. It is our understanding and based on the best information available that we have currently, uh, we have 20 meter right of way on Queen Street and 20 meter right of way on St. David Street. And through all of the official plans and transportation master plan, secondary plan, et cetera, everything that has been done to date has indicated that our arterials and collectors should be a minimum of 26 meters. So it would be a further six meters to the 20 meters, three meters aside typically. Ms. Okay, Richardson, uh, further? Follow up, does the right of way include the sidewalks or is that excluding the sidewalks? Uh, to you, Mr. Chair, the, the right of way includes all of the municipal property. So it's everything that we have jurisdiction over, all of the utilities, in terms of water, sanitary, storm, sidewalks, curb, road, cross section itself, street trees. Okay. And a further follow up then. So, if and when this expansion ever happens, you would be taking property on both sides of St. David and both sides of Queen Street? Uh, to you, Mr. Chair, that, that's the typical perspective. It might be related to what is the nature of what is on either side, whether there's a physical boundary of some sort or something for which you cannot take a widening. Um, what comes to mind is a potential cemetery, for instance. Sometimes that would lend itself to trying to switch the road to the other side. But in general, it's taken even across both sides if possible. Again, the planning horizon has been in place for a long time. So the protection for it moving forward is what we're looking for. Okay, a, a further follow-up then. To me, um, a 12 meter triangle required on the this application property, if that also means a 12 meter requirement on the property on the east side of St. David, that's a huge amount of property for a daylight triangle. Are you planning on a turning circle in that, or what you call it, you know, those new um, circles, whatever they're called? Is that the proposal? Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, that's not a proposal before us now. Right now, the intersection is being looked at simply by what is the design requirement. What would happen later would be an actual environmental assessment whereby this where any of the work we do could be provided through the lens of needing to know whether we ha would have to take land, what would be the desired cross section in terms of two sidewalks, one sidewalk, bike lanes, everything would have to be going through the actual official design process, which is, a, as Mr. Hawley has indicated, is a multi-stage process, typically. Thank you. Further questions of the, uh... Uh, Mr. Holly, I think what I'm hearing just from a personal perspective is that um, with, with the design situation, if we can streamline the process at this stage, then it may very well um, prevent uh, expropriation down the road, which can become a very adversarial process. Uh, that's, my, that's my understanding right now. Would that be somewhere correct, uh, Ms. Sisson? Uh, to you, Mr. Chair, my understanding is that that is indeed the, the purpose and the, yeah. the reason that this is available through the Planning Act process is my understanding. Thank you for that. Anything further of Ms. Sisson or Mr. Hawley? All right. Is the applicant online? Does the applicant wish to speak to the application? Uh, yes, I am. Thank you, Mr. Chair. It's uh, Jeff Farquhar. I'm the owner. Are you online or on phone, uh, Mr. Farquhar? I'm on my phone. Okay. Oh, by the way, before I uh, let you start, uh, something I admitted at the beginning, uh, as I say, this is a whole new process, but when someone, when someone is asking to speak, uh, we will afford you uh, up to 10 minutes. No one has ever taken that long, but we will afford you that amount of time, and that goes for anyone that wishes to speak. 
And um, if you require further time, I will ask the committee uh, for a decision on whether or not we will grant that. But at, initially to start, we'll, uh, we'll listen up to uh, 10 minutes. So go ahead, Mr. Farquhar, sorry about that. No problem, thank you. Uh, um, so I'd also like to just thank uh, Mr. Hawley here. As, as he had mentioned, we've had some pretty uh, lengthy con conversations because, um, you know, uh, a few of these things, it's it's becoming, uh, you know, a, a tough um, tough thing to work around with the widenings and, and, and you know, looking at them with uh, my house being within those uh, widenings that they want to take. So we've, we've had some like, discussions back and forth. Um, and, and speaking with Mr. Hawley, he was mentioning that, with the minor variances um, that are going to be required that um, it's most likely we're, we'll be back in July to, to deal with the minor variances also. Um, so we had some discussions because we're still having um, some things to possibly work out. So um, I had talked to him about uh, asking the committee's permission to possibly defer and bring it back um, as one as one uh, large consent with with the consent for severance also with the minor variances so it kind of kind of goes together as a, as a streamlining process and then that will also give us uh, a bit more time to to have some discussions over, over some of the issues that uh, that we're kind of having some uh, contention about mr holly do you wish to speak to that mm. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, we had we've had some long discussions about. Um, there are some, I believe, there are some technical issues that Mr. Farquhar is trying to deal with, in terms of house siting, um, the the access to the to the newly created lot, um, and sort of, you know, trying to maybe see if there's a if there's a slightly different uh, lot configuration moving the lots uh, lot line for, uh, further south um, we're we're agreeable we're agreeable to uh, to a tabling as well to try to uh, to try to work through some of these things um, it may be advantageous for the committee as well to see the revised layout and uh, and the variances together um, we're trying to I guess sort of figure out, uh, what impact the widening on Queen plus the site triangle would have. Again, it's, it's one of those issues, is, is enough land left over to provide parking to allow for the conversion of, the, uh, of that dwelling to a, uh, you know, to a mixed use scenario. What sort uh, of time frame are you looking at, Mr. Holly? So if, if Mr. Farquhar submitted minor variances, you know, shortly, we probably wouldn't be able to get them on until July anyways. If committee approved this today, um, we'd be back again in July for, uh, for the variances. So we've, we're hopeful that, we're hopeful that a demonstration plan can be prepared, you know, next week to show what the revised uh, proposal would be for Mr. Farquhar. And sort of get an get an idea of whether an, a revised parking scenario uh, could be could be provided to us as well that we could consider. And then, if we're in agreement with that, the variances would then be based on that. He would submit those, and then we would advertise them, and then we would um, try to process them back on for for the July meeting. That's the intention. Thank you. And given the fact that I'm hearing this, there's a potential consensus between the city and the applicant with respect to a deferral, then I would suggest that it's probably appropriate that uh, I would be asking for a deferral. But before I do that, um, I, I want to give, there's always a situation whereby uh, people aren't advised of situations whereby deferrals might be in order. And as a result, they either uh, appear at a meeting or they're online uh, with the comments they might have and it might not be convenient for them to uh, come back to a July meeting or whatever. So I'm going to ask if there's anyone online that wishes to speak to uh, this application other than the uh, applicant. Uh, 
I'm advisor someone on the telephone. Yes, Mr. Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair, I believe the Macaulay's are on on the call here. Um, I, could, could, could the Macaulay's hear us talking with respect to a potential deferral? Yes, John Macaulay speaking. Okay, Mr. Macaulay, uh, uh, I'm the chair of the committee and um, just speaking to the application, it would appear there's a consensus between the city and the applicant to defer this matter to no later than July. Um, does that fit your schedule? Uh, could you um, come back um, for, a, for a, another meeting uh, regarding the application? I certainly can. I certainly can, by all means. I, I'd only like to say one thing here quickly is where the house is sitting, why is the house sitting so close to the street, the new house that's proposed? I would why ask that if you can... Yeah, I would ask that if you can come back to a, uh, a subsequent meeting that you hold those questions for that time, if you would. Okay, all right, that's fine. Yep, I'm thank good with yep. that, no problem. Yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate your, uh, your cooperation there. All right. Okay, we, and thank you for allowing me to speak. Yeah, thank you, sir. Okay, all right, is there you, anyone bye. other than the Macaulay's online that wishes to speak to this application? All right, it would appear there aren't any, any others. So uh, I go to the committee. Um, you've heard the discussions committee, so I guess we're looking for a deferral uh, no later than the uh, meeting uh, in July. And what would, do we know what that date would be, Charlotte? Oh, I got it right here. Great. So that would be a deferral to no later than the meeting on July the 15th, 2021. So can I get a motion on the floor then for that? Mr. Strangway, do I have a seconder? Oh, Ms. Richardson? All right, the only uh, discussions uh, on a deferral relate to uh, the timelines and we've been told, we, I think the motion's fairly specific about that. So any further comments on the timeline? All right. So the question I'm going to ask is, are you in favor or opposed? And uh, just either one uh, when uh, I call your name. So we'll go with Councillor Yo. In favor. All right. Ms. Archer. In favor. Ms. Richardson. In favor. Okay, Mr. Strangway. In favor. All right, and I'm in favor. Thank you very much for that. All right, moving right along then. We're Thank now you, dealing Chair, with file, file number D20-2021-001, and this is 37 Adelaide Street North. Mr. Staten, go ahead, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to confirm, can everyone see the slides that I have displayed? Committee, are you okay with that? Yes. Thank I'm, you. Okay, I'm hearing yes, so go ahead, Mr. Staten. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The purpose and effect of this application is to request relief from the following provisions of the Town of Lindsay Zoning Bylaw in order to facilitate the construction of a new five-story seniors apartment building. One, which would be section 11.3.7G, which is to increase the maximum building height from 18 meters to 21.8 meters in order to allow for rooftop mechanical and design features. Section 5.12, uh, subsection J, subsection X or 10, to allow 28 parking spaces within the front yard and finally, section 5.13B uh, to allow for a portion, portion of a loading space within the front yard. As mentioned, the proposal involves the construction of a new five-story 178 unit. Uh, I must add that in the report, it was indicated that 176 units were proposed. I would like the record to reflect this change. 
Uh, there are no implications with respect to density as a result of the inaccuracy, and it does not change any of the reliefs provided uh, through this application. Uh, I wanted to point out as well that a site plan application has been submitted with three rounds of comments provided between December 2019 and December 2020. It's also important to note that the lands are subject to a holding provision relating to a site plan approval being granted and the confirmation of adequate supply of municipal water and sanitary services to the proposed development. The removal of the holding provision is tentatively scheduled for the May 2021 Council meeting. Through review of the site plan approval submissions, planning staff identified that relief from the building height, loading space and parking space location provisions would be required. The subject property is situated on a portion of the Old Lindsay Fairgrounds adjacent to the former Fair Avenue entrance. The property is bordered by Adelaide Street North on the east, which is shown here. The Adelaide Street North, uh, Colburn Street neighborhood uh, where higher residential densities exist is evidenced by the three apartment buildings, one proposed apartment building and a retirement residence with the civic addresses 53 Adelaide Street North, uh, 107, 126, and 133 Colburn Street East, with the vacant lands to the south of 126 Colburn Street East, also slated for development uh, within the vicinity of the subject lands. The building will provide additional residential options within Lindsay. The additional story is required for design elements in order to conceal the rooftop mechanical features of the building. It's important to note that the additional story is not required for additional residential units. The additional story is not anticipated to adversely impact the Adelaide Street North streetscape and will complement the overall facade and appearance of the building as uh, will be shown in the subsequent slides. Shown here is Appendix C or the oh, existing site plan uh, of the proposal um, shown facing northwards, or sorry, westwards. Note the proposed entrance from uh, Fair Avenue and Adelaide Street North in the southeast corner, um, as well as the, the loading space, which is approximately right here. Um, as well as the proposed parking, which is situated in the front yard here. The first part of Appendix D, or the building elevations are, of the report are shown here. Note the parapets and the cornices, um, as well as the overall rooftop facade um, that is triggering the requirement for the relief. The other set of drawings that uh, comprise Appendix D are shown here. Again, the design elements conceal items like the rooftop stair access, um, elevator shaft, and the rooftop mechanical components. I don't want to spend a lot of time discussing Appendix E or the, uh, the landscape plantings plans as it may be difficult to interpret um, over, over the slides. Uh, however, I, I will mention that screening in the form of additional fencing as well as a variety of tree and shrub species are proposed along the perimeter and in particular adjacent to the uh, loading space and along the front and interior side yards um, uh, in order to buffer any potential visual, visual or auditory impacts resulting from the proposal. Note that through the site plan approval process, the species composition may change, but the foundation of the plan is provided within Appendix, D, Appendix E of your uh, reports. So I'll just skip over these. Uh, so shown on the left is the view of the front yard uh, facing north along Adelaide Street North from the proposed entrance location with the photo on the right taken looking uh, south down Adelaide Street North. A continuous landscape strip is proposed along the front lot line adjacent to Adelaide Street North. The vegetated buffer will assist in alleviating any impacts to the adjacent low-rise residential homes 
uh, on the east side of Adelaide Street North, as well as any impacts to pedestrians. From the same location as the previous slides, the photo on the left captures the intersection of Fair Avenue and Adelaide Street North facing eastwards, with the photo on the right facing northwest, uh, providing a general overview of the site. So for perspective and a, just an overall view of the site, I'd like to take you around the site in a clockwise fashion, beginning in the southeast corner of the site. Again, the, the approximate entrance location, um, which, which used to be the old entrance and site of the ticket gate for the old Lindsay Fairgrounds is shown on the left. The photo on the right is taken to the, uh, the west of the truck uh, as, as shown uh, on the left facing west. You can see a portion of the uh, existing hospital parking lot uh, just off to the left hand side of the photo. The slide on the left here is taken from the southern lot line facing uh, northeast towards Adelaide Street North with the photo on the right uh, taken facing northwards uh, from the same location. You can see the aforementioned uh, 53 Adelaide Street North apartment building in the, the distance. So here we have on the left is a shot uh, taken looking at the, the vacant abutting lands to the west of the proposal. Um, again, looking west towards Angeline Street with the photo on the right looking uh, eastward, giving you an appreciation for the, the overall depth of the lot towards Adelaide. So here is uh, another shot looking east from the uh, western boundary of the site with the photo on the right taken from the, the north boundary of the site looking south towards the hospital, which you can see in the distance. As high rise development is already proposed within the zoning, the addition of one story, again, not containing any habitable units is not anticipated to substantially change the scale of the built form. 18 meters is the maximum height permitted under the zoning bylaw with an additional three meters proposed according to Appendix D for construction elements, again, used to conceal the rooftop access stairs and mechanical items. The proposed parapets, uh, cornices and facade work will uh, ultimately work together for a more aesthetically pleasing product. While the uh, drawings indicate that 21 meters is the maximum height, uh, an additional 0.8 meters for construction differences is being accounted for as part of this application. So I just wanted to show, um, again, the adjacent property, um, 53 Adelaide Street North, in what appears to be a, a six-story apartment building for comparison, uh, which is, again, within the immediate vicinity of the uh, proposal. With respect to the uh, relief required for the loading space on the southeast corner of the building, only a, only a portion of the proposed loading space will be located within the front yard in relation to the uh, eastern face of the building. The intent um, of locating loading spaces in the side or rear yard of buildings is, is obviously to prevent incompatibilities within the front yard and the streetscape. As only a portion of the, the loading space is proposed within the front yard, no in incompatibilities are anticipated, especially considering the landscape and design elements proposed within the front yard, which will help to screen the loading space. The existing vegetation, which you can see here on the left, um, as well as the plantings proposed through the landscape plantings plans, will assist in negating any visual or audio impacts from the presence of the loading dock. Moreover, um, there is an additional screening through the 1.8 meter high fencing that's proposed along the southern lot line, uh, as well as an elaborate raised garden patio, uh, plantings of shrubs, a trellis, and a decorative fountain, which actually mimics the old, uh, the intent is to mimic the old fountain of the fairgrounds uh, proposed within the front yard. Um, so they will assist in being focal points of this, uh, of this particular project. Again, shown on the right is the approximate location of the loading space, sorry, in relation to the hospital. Um, so again, you're, you're not having any residential incompatibilities here. 
um, with the photo on the left showing the approximate approach to what would be the loading space uh, again from uh, coming coming west from Fair Avenue. In terms of parking spaces within the front yard of the subject lands, the intent of limiting parking within the front yard of apartment buildings is to minimize potential conflicts between vehicles, pedestrians, and the streetscape. Landscaping provisions of the zoning bylaw uh, are to provide minimum landscaping requirements in the form of continuous vegetation plantings around the immediate perimeter of the property and the parking lot to buffer the property from the surrounding uses. In this case, the applicant has proposed a comprehensive series of landscape planting plans in order to account for the parking spaces within the front yard of the property. Uh, without relocating the building towards uh, Adelaide Street North, the proposed landscape buffer comprised of tree and shrub species will assist in the integration of the parking spaces with the streetscape and, uh, and uh, provide a uh, an integration between the, the sidewalk uh, for pedestrians as well. I wanted to correct a statement made within the report regarding, regarding the preservation of the mature deciduous trees along Adelaide Street. Uh, unfortunately, the ma vast majority of the tree species will be removed to facilitate the project. However, a variety of tree and shrub species, as I mentioned before, are proposed within the latest uh, landscape plantings plan. The proposed configuration also maintains the amenity space uh, consisting of walkways, gardens, benches for residents within the rear yards of the subject lands. So what I wanted to show here on the left is the approximate location for most of the parking spaces within the, uh, within the front yard, uh, with the slide on the right showing the front yard from the east side of Adelaide Street North uh, facing northwest. Comments on the application were received from Building and Septic Division, as well as the Community Services Division, stating they have no concerns with the proposal. The Engineering and Corporate Assets Division also have no objections to the variances requested, and note that the engineering review of the site plan is uh, site, site plan approval is continuing. Public comments and two letters of opposition uh, were received from Janet Armstrong and John Sanders on April 11th from 47 Chadwin Drive, as well as from uh, Tom and Bertie Murphy on April 13th from the residents of 49 Chadwin Drive. Both letters express concern with respect to lot drainage of the subject lands affecting their properties, privacy issues, and how privacy will be addressed through the landscape plantings plan, the name of the developer and construction timelines, the location of the loading dock and what time garbage pickup slash deliveries would be occurring. The applicant has taken the time to respond to the concerns via email correspondence, which you have been forwarded copies of. In response to the specific areas of concern relating to this application, planning staff uh, offer the following in response to the two letters. With respect to the, the concerns over the height, um, as I mentioned, the requested increase in height from 18 meters to 21.8 meters is not needed for habitable units, but for construction elements used to conceal rooftop access stairs and mechanical items, for instance. While 21 meters is the maximum height indicated in the drawings, again, an additional 0.8 meters for construction differ differences as is being accounted for as part of the application. That's not to say the construction will occur at 21.8 meters, but the additional 0.8 meters was built in as a contingency. As indicated by the applicant, the top of the roof surface meets the maximum building height and the variance is only required to permit the increased height to accommodate rooftop features and architectural details such as cornices, uh, parapets to shield the and screen the rooftop features from the view and, uh, and also add visual interest and curb appeal to the building. It's also important to note that the uh, RH1 uh, special five with the holding provision zone category has been in place on the property since 2006, which always permitted a maximum building height of 18 meters. With respect to the concerns relating to lot drainage and uh, lot drainage impacts, uh, as indicated by the applicant and shown on the, on the left um, at this slide here, the property drains south uh, away from the residential lands to the north with the high point running along the fence line. 
It's noted on the grading plan that the drain shall be self-contained on site by the construction of swales or a drain to a or drain to a protected outlet. Drainage shall not impact adjacent properties. I would also like to point out that in addition to a lot drainage and grading plan, an erosion and sediment control plan, stormwater management plan, and functional servicing report, as well as a hydrogeological report have been prepared and provided as part of the site plan approval process. The documents are being reviewed by staff in order to ensure no negative impacts to the adjacent properties. Moreover, with respect to the privacy issues, as indicated by the applicant, the landscape plan provides for a 1.8 meter high board fence along the perimeter of the site and significant landscaping along the fence line adjacent to the rear yards of Chadwin Drive. The applicant notes that the rear yards along Chadwin Drive um, are to be planted with uh, the following tree species, Eastern White Cedar, Canadian Hemlock, Basswood, White Spruce, Ontario Green Juniper, Colorado Spruce and Common Hackberry. When planted, they will range in height from 1.75 meters to 2.5 meters. It's important to note that at maturity, the majority of these trees will range in height from 10 meters to 20 meters. There's also enhanced landscaping provided acknowledging the existing deciduous tree and shrub species in between the loading space and the southern lot line. It's important to note again that the loading space is adjacent to the hospital parking lot and the rear of the adjacent residential lot and will not have an impact on the residents of Chadwin Drive to the north of the proposed building. With respect to noise, as indicated by the applicant, the mullock or uh, the semi underground waste containers, they're called mullocks, uh, which are partially buried, will be located on the southeast corner of the property on the south side of the building. Collection times will be during normal business hours to respect the needs of the surrounding residential community. Based on review of the application and the contents of report, staff acknowledges the application meets all four tests of a minor variance and staff respectfully recommends approval of the application subject to the conditions within the report. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Are there any questions of the uh, planner from committee? Uh, Councillor Yo, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you. Just for clarification, I just want to make sure I understand. The maximum height allowed in the zoning is 18 meters, and the additional 3.8 meters is not necessarily residential units, but it's for construction purposes to hide stuff. Is that correct? Through, Mr. Staten, go ahead. You, Mr. Yeah, through, through you, Chair, and to uh, Member Yo, yes, that is correct. The, the additional height increase is not for additional residential units. It is essentially for design features associated with the building, which will ultimately conceal some of the more, we'll say, unsightly uh, elements of the, uh, of the building. And the three meter construction difference is allowed in the zoning, so it's only 0.8 meters that they're asking for relief. Through you, Mr. Chair, it's actually 18 is the maximum. So yeah. they're actually asking for 3.8 meters, um, but they're only intending as a, in accordance with the plans to be using approximately three meters of that 3.8 meters. The additional height is, is sort of a, a contingency. Should they go any higher with the design elements in order to better conceal those, uh, those elements of the rooftop? Thank you. Further questions of the uh, planner? All right, being none. Is the applicant online? Does the applicant wish to speak to the application? Oh, yes. Hello, good afternoon, yes. And could you state your name, please? Yes, my name is Carolyn Molinari. From right. Planning, and I represent the owners of the property. All right, go ahead, please. Yes, I'm here with the architect, Jason DeBrum, uh, who is also available to address the committee if there are any questions. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to appear before the committee and to address the application. Uh, first off, I would just like to say that I just got a um, uh, notice on my computer that my internet connection, connection is unstable. I've never seen that before, so I don't know if you'll lose me or not, but uh, I'll just carry on. Um, and so I would just like to add as well that we uh, appreciate the efforts of staff, uh, both with the processing of the site plan application and this minor variance application. 
We have reviewed and are in agreement with the findings and the conditions included in the staff report. The report and Mr. Staten's comments cover pretty much everything that I could think to say. Um, so I'll just add a few highlighting comments. Uh, the property is being developed, as, he, as Mr. Staten mentioned, with a five-story senior citizen's home as permitted by the zoning bylaw. And the variances come from a need really to uh, accommodate the siting of the building on an irregular, irregularly shaped lot, which narrows uh, significantly to the rear. So generally the proposal um, to have some of the parking and a portion of the loading space in the front yard is needed to preserve the relatively small backyard, rear yard and uh, south side yard for uh, use of the residents. And uh, so this way we are meeting the parking requirements of the zoning bylaw, because if we had cited the building closer to the road, we might uh, lose some of those or uh, force them into the rear yard. And the additional height requirement is needed to allow for the rooftop features and building facade enhancements in order to screen the mechanical equipment from view. So it's mainly required for rooftop mechanical and aesthetic purposes. And it is not, as uh, Mr. Satan mentioned, to allow for an additional story. Um, as well, I would just note that there are several zoning bylaws uh, for various townships within the city, uh, including the townships of Bexley, Eldon, Emily, Fenland, Mariposa and Somerville, as well as the villages of Omimi and Fenland Falls. Uh, they have all have had um, updated wording for the definition of height to exclude such things as uh, 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 rooftop constructions, uh, construction enclosing equipment or stairs and accessory roof fixtures and facilities. And I would note that the city is currently undertaking a zoning bylaw review to update and amalgamate the zoning bylaws. So perhaps this variation in how height is determined will be rectified through uh, this review to include such exclusions for all areas within the city, including Lindsay. But for now, um, we need to deal with it through this minor variance application. And as well, and although this has been addressed in the staff report, I'll just go over the four tests set out in the Planning Act for minor variances. Uh, the first test that the application maintain the intent and purpose of the official plan. Uh, the variances are to accommodate the proposed use as permitted in the residential, residential designation. Uh, test number two, the application maintains the intent and purpose of the zoning bylaw. Uh, it, it does as the site specific zone permits the permitted use or the, the proposed use and the application just tweaks a few minor uh, requirements of the zoning bylaw to accommodate the siting of the building and the required number of parking spaces and loading space. Uh, as well, the variances will be screened through fencing, landscaping, architectural details uh, to prevent any impacts along the streetscape. Uh, test number three, that the application is desirable for the appropriate development or use of the land. The development will be in keeping with similar surrounding land uses as mentioned in the staff report. It will allow for the development as proposed, providing for the much needed long-term care facility and as well significant landscaping and design elements in the front yard, a wider than required landscape buffer along Adelaide Street and upgraded facade details will help screen any potential impacts of the variances. And finally, the fourth test that the application be minor in nature uh, in the context that no reduction to the parking space requirement is proposed. This is just a way to accommodate what is required uh, given the challenges of the site. Uh, it provides for the benefit of additional landscape open space in the front yard. And the increase in the height is as mentioned only for mechanical and architectural screening purposes. Uh, so as a planner, it's my opinion that the requested variances are reasonable and meet the four tests. Again, we appreciate staff's input and uh, I'm available to answer any questions. Thanks, thanks sir. Thank you and uh, thank you for those comments. Are there any questions of the applicant by uh, committee members? Councilor Yo, go ahead. Um, thank you, through you, Mr. Chair. Just um, for my own curiosity, the um, the elevations uh, survey or plot plan calls the uh, the building a retirement home, and the um, application is for seniors' apartments. Now, to me, in my mind, there's a difference, but is there any difference in that wording? Who wishes to respond to that? 
Uh, sorry, you're out of luck, Councillor Yeo, but no. Mr. Hawley, do you want to speak to that? Um, I mean, there's probably some subtle differences in, in definitions. I don't, I don't have them uh, out with me right now um, to determine exactly if there is any difference between the two of them or not. Um, I suspect probably not. Um, otherwise, we wouldn't be processing the application if it didn't um, if it didn't meet the intent of the zoning bylaw. But I don't have to answer Councillor Yo's question directly. I don't have the definitions in front of me. I think I saw the chief building official's hand there. Go ahead, uh, Ms. Mertson. For you, Mr. Chair, um, there's different um, aspects of where you're going to do definitions. So there's zoning, and then there's building code. The building code actually does specifically um, define a retirement home. Uh, they're, they're governed under a certain act. And so there is a difference between a retirement home, uh, just a residential building, which is residential apartments, and then there's nursing homes. They all are, are governed by different acts. So I believe this one is going to align with that retirement home uh, definition in the building code. Councilor Yo. Yeah, leave it up to a carpenter to pick that one out, eh? Um, no, that's fine, as long as, um, as long as everybody's clear at the building. Thank you. All right, thank you for that. Are there any further questions of the applicant? All right, being none. Is there anyone online wishing to speak in support of this application, in support of this application? Anyone online wishing to speak in opposition to this application? Opposition to the application. No, oh, but appear there are not. All right, back to uh, back to you, committee. What are what's your pleasure? I don't see any hands. Uh, Councillor Yo, go ahead. I uh, look for a motion. I'll move it as printed. Do I have a seconder? Uh, okay, Mr. Strangway. Mr. Councillor Yo, do you want to speak to it further? No, I'm good. Thank you, Mr. Strangway. No, I'm good as well. It uh, that's fine. All right. Any further comments or questions from other committee members? All right, then I will ask the question again. Are you in favor or opposed? And uh, we may as well start with you again, Councillor Yo. Go ahead. In favor. Okay, Mr. Strangway. In favor. Ms. Richardson. In favor. Ms. Archer. In favor. And I'm in favor. Thank you very much. And to the applicant, thank you uh, very much uh, for taking the time. Uh, we appreciate your comments. Thank you very much. All right. Moving right along here, we're now dealing with file number D20-2021-006, and this is to Huntingdon Court, Township of Fenland. And we have a memo indicating that we're looking for a deferral. It's fairly self-explanatory, but Mr. Stanton, do you wish to speak to it? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I will quickly speak to it. Um, on uh, April 1st, the Building and Septic Division staff provided uh, Planning Division with a letter identifying that the application for minor variance in its current configuration cannot be supported. A sewage system permit to install was issued to replace the existing sewage system serving the existing uh, single detached dwelling, uh, accommodating a required clearance distance to the proposed boathouse. The spatial separation from the septic system proposal did not accommodate for the allowance in habitable space, which is, was identified as a sunroom within the minor variance application form within the boathouse. The supervisor of Part 8 uh, Sewage Systems has advised that the boathouse be reconfigured 
greater clarity on the functionality of the proposed second story of the boathouse be provided or the existing septic system be amended. Through conversations with the applicant, it is important to note that there are no plans to connect the septic system to the boathouse and that the second story is for proposed storage. Planning staff is, however, supportive of the request um, from the Building and Septic Division and is requesting the committee consider deferring the application for a period of not more than four months, returning at the latest to the August 19th, 2021 meeting. I do know that the applicant has a desire to, uh, to, to have the application returned much sooner than that. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Staten. Is the applicant online? Does the applicant wish to speak to the deferral? Yes, my name is Gary Newhook. Uh, I'm the applicant. Uh, what have I? Oh, your name, sir? My name is Gary Newhook. Go ahead. And I'm the, I'm the applicant for this. Uh, and Kent and I have been uh, talking about this. and I. I understand the deferral and uh, we're hoping to get into next month. All right, thank you for that. All right, and again, I'm going to ask, uh, is there anyone online that wishes to speak to this application in support of or opposed to? Anyone online wishing to speak in support of or opposed to this application? All right, being none, then I'll go back to uh, committee and uh, looking for a deferral motion uh, to, our, to come back no later than the August 19th, 2021 meeting. I got Ms. Archer uh, for the deferral and Ms. Richardson second. All right. Any further comments or questions regarding to the timeline? All right. And again, the question in favor or opposed and let's start with Ms. Archer this time. In favor. All right, Ms. Richardson. In favor. All right, Mr. Strangway. In favor. Councilor Yo. In favor. And I'm in favor. All right, thank you very much for that. Okay. All right, moving right along. We're dealing with file number D20-2021-015. And this is vacant land on Cross Creek Road Geographic Township of Ops. Mr. Staten, go ahead, sir. I guess I better unmute myself. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, uh, I just wanted to confirm again that people could see the slides. Thank you. So the purpose and effect yep. of this application is to request relief from the following provision in order to fulfill a condition of provisional consent, which was associated with a lot line adjustment as part of consent file D03-2020-027. And that section of the ops zoning bylaw would be section 16.2B to reduce the minimum lot area required under the agricultural zone from 37 hectares to 27.5 hectares. The acting director of development services as delegated by council has recently granted provisional consent for file D03-2020-027 to sever approximately 980 square meters from the subject lands on Cross Creek Road and add those lands to three uh, to the civic address 308 Cross Creek Road. The resultant area of the retained lands are again approximately 27.5 hectares or 68 acres in size. Through review of the consent application, it was determined that the retained agricultural lands did not meet the minimum lot area requirements for the zoning bylaw. Condition five of the provisional consent approval requires a variance to the retained agricultural parcel to recognize a lot area less than is required by the zoning bylaw. The application is concurrent with minor variance number 20, uh, D20-2021-016, whereby an existing detached garage with a reduced front yard setback is being proposed. The subject property is located within a rural neighborhood southeast of the former town of Lindsay. The subject lands contain a barn which was constructed in 1920 according to MPAC. There is a farm entrance off of Cross Creek Road. 
that will be seen in subsequent slides that was identified during the site visit. The predominant surrounding land use in the area is agricultural, um, consisting of beef and cash crop operations, with the Scugog River, uh, as seen in the slide, uh, just to the south of the parcel. According to records, the subject lands have undergone two severances for essentially what would equate to one acre parcels, both in 1972 for the property known as 386 Cross Creek Road, which would be about here, as well as 19, in 1989, which is the, uh, the benefiting lands in consent file D03-2020-027. Uh, known as 308 Cross Creek Road. Essentially, the parcel has, has always been undersized, notwithstanding the aforementioned severances. And again, 308, just for context, is in the northwest corner right here. The existing water record as shown on the sketch for severance maintains a triangular shape shown in the top left here. Uh, that is based on the unopened road allowance to the west and the Scugog River to the south. Based on records from the aforementioned consent applications in 1972 and 1989 respectively, the subject lands were always undersized. The requirement to recognize the deficiency in lot area is triggered as a result of the consent application whereby the lot size is slightly decreased by 980 square meters or 0.2 of an acre. No impacts to the operation of the property, uh, nor the neighborhood are anticipated as a result of this acknowledgement. Shown here on the left is the existing barn um, with the, uh, the photos, again, both photos were taken from Cross Creek Road, which is assumed and maintained by the city, might I add, um, facing southwards. The slide on the right shows the aforementioned uh, existing field entrance here. The slide on the left shown here uh, just captures the agricultural presence in the area with the photo taken facing northeast from Cross Creek Road and the photo on the right is, is taken facing eastward along Cross Creek Road. You can see the, uh, the agricultural lands uh, to, the, to the right of the road here. Um, as one travels further uh, eastward, the um, the property transitions actually to, to wetland uh, before terminating at the western lot line of 386 Cross Creek Road, one of the properties previously severed in 1972. So these photos are taken uh, from the previously mentioned eastern end of Cross Creek Road facing west. You can see the, the wetland here actually on both sides, but on the, on the, um, on the south side in particular, um, uh, as well as the, uh, the boathouse and dwelling at 38, uh, 386 Cross Creek Road, which is shown on the right. The photo on the left uh, illustrates the property at 308 Cross Creek Road or the benefiting lands through the associated consent application with the photo on the right, again, just providing an overview of the, um, of the subject agricultural lands. The purposes under the zoning bylaw um, and intent of the minimum lot area requirement of an agricultural zone are essentially to ensure that buildings and structures do not dominate the parcel in terms of amassing and lot coverage perspective. So through spreading out development on larger parcels, adequate lot drainage um, can also be maintained. As previously mentioned, based on the records from the aforementioned consent applications in 1972 and 1989, the subject lands were always undersized as per the minimum lot area requirements of the agricultural zone category. The resultant lot area, which is only 9.5 hectares less than the minimum lot area required under the zoning bylaw, does not impair the functionality of the lot as an agricultural property. The lot possesses adequate frontage in compliance with the zoning bylaw as well. Comments were received from Engineering and Corporate Assets Division, Building and Septic Division, as well as Community Service Division, stating they have no concerns with the proposal. Based on the contents of the report, staff acknowledges the application meets all four tests of a minor variance and staff requ uh, respectfully requests the application be approved subject to the conditions of the report. Thank you. And thank you, sir.
Any questions of the planner by committee members? All right, being none, is the applicant online? Does the applicant wish to speak to this application? Good afternoon, uh, this is Roberta Perdue, the applicant. Thank you, go um, ahead. Through, through you, Mr. Chair, I would just uh, like to thank Kent for his report. Mr. and Mrs. McCabe are anxious to resolve this issue um, to complete the consent application for the lot addition and I'm available to answer any of your questions. All right, thank you for that. Are there any questions of the applicant by committee members? All right, being none, is there anyone online wishing to speak in support of this application? In support of this application? Anyone online wishing to speak in opposition to this application? Opposition to the application? Committee looking for a motion. Mr. Strangway, second, oh, go, go ahead. As printed. All right, seconded by Ms. Richardson. Any further comments or questions? All right, again, I'll start with you, Mr. Strangway. Uh, in favor. Ms. Richardson. In favor. Yeah, Ms. Archer. In favor. Councilor Yo. In favor. And I'm in favor. All right. Thank you for that. All right. The applicant's still online. Your application has been approved. Thank you. All right. Moving right along. We're dealing with file number D20-2021-016, and this is 308 Cross Creek Road, Geographic Township of Ops. You're a busy fellow today, Mr. Stanton. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm afraid you guys are with me for from here on out, so uh, please, please bear with me, actually, in particular on the next two applications. Um, not this one, but the, the following two. Um, so, so this, uh, this application is actually associated with the previous application. Um, it is the purpose and effect is to essentially request relief from the following provisions in order to fulfill again, a provision of, uh, a condition of provisional consent associated with the lot line adjustment as part of condition or sorry, as part of consent file D03-2020-027 by recognizing the location of an existing detached garage. So that would be section 5.2 of the former uh, Township of Ops zoning bylaw in order to recognize a reduced uh, front yard setback um, for the detached garage from nine meters to 2.32 meters. Uh, as mentioned in the previous application, the acting director of development services as de delegated by council has granted a provisional consent for file D03-2020-027 to sever approximately 980 square meters from the subject lands on Cross Creek Road um, and add them to the, uh, actually I should say from vacant lands on Cross Creek Road and add them to the subject lands at uh, uh, 308 Cross Creek Road. Through review of the consent application, it was determined that the subject property is a corner lot abutting an unopened road allowance. And as such, the Western lot line was determined to be the front lot line as defined in the zoning bylaw. Uh, an existing detached garage um, is located within the, the front yard of the subject property. Uh, it's important to note that detached structures are permitted within the front yards of the Township of Ops zoning bylaw. Condition five of the provisional consent uh, approval requires a variance to recognize the reduced front yard setback of the garage in relation to the front lot line. The application is concurrent with the previously heard minor variance file D20-2021-015. The subject property is located uh, within a rural neighborhood southeast of the town of Lindsay. The bungalow with walkout basement was constructed in 1974, according to MPAC. The predominant surrounding land use in the area is agricultural. Um, with the Scugog River located to the south of the property. 
shown here in the sketch for severance uh, used in the consent application depicting the location of building and the buildings and structures in relation to the lot boundaries. As the lot abuts the unopened road allowance shown here, um, it is considered a corner lot. Uh, in this case, since the western lot line is actually shorter than the uh, northern lot line, uh, the western yard is considered the front yard for the purposes of administering the zoning bylaw. Regardless of the definition, the front yard functions as an exterior side yard. Um, correspondence with Engineering and Corporate Assets Division has indicated that the unopened road allowance, which is essentially a continuation of Bridal Road to the north, uh, will not be uh, reopened. The location of the garage um, is shown on the, uh, just to the left of the dwelling here. So it's, it's actually labeled as, as a frame shed, um, but as you'll see, it's, it's essentially a garage. Shown here are some photos of the existing single detached dwelling taken from Cross Creek Road on the left and a photo taken facing south showing the unopened road allowance from the intersection of Bridal Road and Cross Creek Road on the right. The garage is actually located to the left of the road allowance, so it's essentially right in here. Uh, these are just some photos taken uh, west and east, respectfully, uh, along or respectively along the exterior side yard or Cross Creek Road in both directions, just to give you a context uh, of where of where it is. Uh, in relation to Cross Creek Road. The photo on the left uh, here is showing the agricultural operation on the, the northwest corner of the intersection of Cross Creek Road and Bridal Road. The photo on the right is capturing uh, the front yard uh, in here uh, of the subject property facing south. You can see the garage just to the, to the left of center behind the, the trailer, so you can see it right here. So here we have the garage um, on the photo on the left uh, facing southeast uh, towards the front lot line with the photo on the right providing a photo of the garage. Uh, again, it's essentially a zoomed in uh, photo taken from the previous slide um, taken from the north. A building permit was issued for the detached garage in 1992. While the construction predates the current township of OPS zoning bylaw, the previous iteration of the zoning bylaw from 1987 also identifies the front yard setback for detached structures as being nine meters. Noteworthy is the fact that neither version of the zoning bylaw restricts the placement of accessory buildings or structures from being situated in the front yard. The variance is requested to acknowledge and rectify the reduced front yard setback the proposal will acknowledge the existing location of the garage in relation to the front lot line. There are no anticipated massing issues and impacts to sight lines. Overall, the functionality of the front yard will not be diminished. The photo on the left shows the garage again in relation to the front lot line um, to, the, to the north, facing northwards, I should say, uh, while the photo on the right uh, is taken facing eastward, illustrating the location of the dwelling in relation to the garage. As the intent of the front yard setback is to provide spatial separation between the road and residential uses, acknowledging the existing 2.32 uh, meter setback is appropriate. The front lot line is delineated by dense vegetation as shown on the, in the photo on the left, screening the property from the road allowance and the neighboring property at 300 Cross Creek Road, which is to the west as shown on the photo to the right. So the garage again is right here and here we are at 300 Cross Creek Road. The front yard setback of 2.32 meters is of sufficient space to provide for lot and building maintenance as well. Comments were received from Engineering and Corporate Assets Divisi Division, Building and Septic Division, and Community Services Division, stating they have no concerns with the proposal. Based on the contents of the report, staff acknowledges the application meets all four tests of a minor variance. The staff respectfully recommends approval of the application subject to the conditions identified, or actually the one condition identified in the report. Thank you.
Thank you, uh, Mr. Staten. Are there any committee questions of the planner? All right, being none, then is the applicant online? Does the applicant wish to speak to the application? Hello, thank you. It's Roberta Purdue again, uh, through you, Mr. Chair. Again, I would like to thank Kent for his report and I'm available for any questions of the committee. All right, thank you very much uh, for that. Are there any questions of the applicant? All right, being none. Is there anyone online wishing to speak in support of this application? In support of this application. Anyone online wishing to speak in opposition to this application? Opposition to the application. Being none, back to committee for a motion. Councillor Yo. The house printed. Do I have a seconder? Mr. Richardson. All right. Any further comments or questions? All right. And I'll start with Councillor Yo. In favor or? In favor. All right. And Ms. Richardson. In favor. Okay. Ms. Archer. In favor. Mr. Strangway. In favor. And I'm in favor. All right. It's working like a well oiled machine. The application is approved. Thank you very much. Alrighty, moving right along. We're dealing now with file number D20-2021-019. And this is 17 Denfield Road, former town of Lindsay. And uh, Mr. Staten has indicated that uh, these were previously Mr. Harding's applications. So uh, we'll try not to give them too hard a time. Go ahead, Mr. Staten. Thank you for that, Mr. Chair. Uh, just, just for the record, I, I was on site for both applications and I am familiar with, very familiar with both files. This application in particular, uh, the purpose and effect is to request relief from section 6.2H of the former town of Lindsay zoning bylaw in order to increase the maximum lot coverage from 35% to 40% in order to permit the construction of a new single detached dwelling on the subject lands. The subject property is situated in a newer residential neighborhood containing a residential, a single detached residential dwellings. Some of the lots along Denfield have been developed later than the surrounding dwellings. The subject property is the last vacant residential lot within the neighborhood. As a result, the subject property is surrounded on all sides by single detached dwellings. There is a pedestrian link, as you can see here on the western side, um, that, that, that does go through the, uh, the subdivision. Um, and uh, essentially it links Denfield with Murdoch Court to the south. The proposal will allow for a dwelling um, with additional living space to be created. The, the rear yard will be in excess of 10 meters or 32 feet deep. The minimum required is 7.5. A rear yard of sufficient depth will be retained for outdoor recreational amenity purposes. So as you can see here, the rear yard to the south. Uh, this is just a, um, a survey of the subject lands. Shown here is the um, proposed elevations associated with the development. Again, this style is uh, uniform, uh, relatively uniform throughout the uh, neighborhood and uh, doesn't deviate from the existing built form of the neighborhood. So as you can see here on the left is a shot facing, facing south of the vacant lands. Again, the walkway on the right and the photo on the right here is taken from the subject lands uh, looking to the north um, over the, uh, over the, the other um, single detached dwellings along uh, Denfield Drive. The 
the proposal will allow for a dwelling, um, again, of uh, a dwelling with additional living space to be created. The proposed increase in lot coverage is not anticipated to be perceptible as the scale of the built form will not change when viewed from the street or the walkway. Um, some photos here shown. So this is actually taken facing south and that would be to the east of the, the subject lands. And the photo on the right again is facing south and that is uh, to the west of the subject lands with the walkway shown on the left. The subject property is zoned residential type one within the town of Lindsay zoning bylaw. The lot coverage requirement ensures a sufficient degree of landscaped open space is maintained. And it's also um, the intent of it is to control more technical aspects of development such as stormwater management. Adequate outdoor amenity space is being retained as seen here in the rear yard on the left. Again, this is facing south. And the walkway, this would be facing west, is uh, on the slide to the right. The, it's important to note as well that the Development Engineering Division has advised that there are no concerns with respect to um, lot, lot drainage as a result of the increased lot coverage. Uh, as the, uh, the Lindsay Secondary Plan um, is, is under appeal, the, the lands are uh, designated residential within the official plan. The subject property is within a neighborhood that would be classified as low density. The low density residential uses include single detached dwellings um, and in addition to a single detached dwelling uh, is, is proposed. In consideration of the, uh, the variance, uh, it maintains the general intent and purpose of the official plan. Comments were received from uh, Development Engineering and Corporate Assets Division, as well as Building and Septic Division and Community Services with uh, no concerns. Building, Division, Building and Septic Division did note that permits are required and development charges do apply. Based on review of the application, uh, staff confirm the application meets the four tests of a minor variance and recommends approval subject to the conditions within the report. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Steen. Are there any questions of the uh, planner? All right, being none. Is the applicant online? Does the applicant wish to speak to the application? All right, apparently the applicant is not online. Is there anyone online wishing to speak in support of this application, in support of the application? Anyone online wishing to speak in opposition to this application, opposition to the application? Back to committee. What are your wishes? Ms. Archer. As printed. Do I have a seconder? Mr. Strangway, all right. Any further comments or questions? All right, and we'll start with Ms. Archer. In favor or opposed? In favor. All right, Mr. Strangway? In favor. Councilor Yo. In favor. Mrs. Richardson? In favor. And I'm in favor. It's a pretty slick process, this. All right, and the application is approved. And moving right along, we're now dealing with file number D20-2021-021, and this is 26 and 28 Sanderling Court, Geographic Township of Fenland. Go ahead, Mr. Stanton. Mr. Stanton, are you with us? Yeah, I, I am. Yes, I... Uh, it's concerned for that, your safety there. So, sometimes that, that mute button gets me. Um, yeah, so the, uh, the purpose and effect of the subject application is to recreate two residential lots uh, that have essentially merged on title uh, by seeking relief from the following provisions. 
the two civic addresses in question are 26 Sandra Lane Court and 28 Sandra Lane Court. The reliefs requested from 26 Sandra Lane Court are from section 11.2.1.2 of the former township of Fenland zoning bylaw to reduce the minimum lot frontage requirement from 38 meters to 23 meters and section 11.2.1.3b to reduce the minimum interior side yard setback from three meters on the south side to only 2.8 meters. And with respect to 28 Sanderling Court, the variance is requested from section 11.2.1.2 to reduce the minimum lot frontage requirement from 38 meters to 29 meters. So this application was submitted in anticipation of the issuance of a decision by the Acting Director of Development Services with respect to consent file D03-2020-11. The owners have agreed with the proposed conditions within the staff recommendation for consent. One of the conditions within the consent is to obtain variances for the lot frontage and interior side yard setback in order to essentially recreate the two residential lots that merged on title. The application will, will serve to reestablish independent over ownership over the single detached dwellings addressed as 26 and 28 Sanderling Court. 26 seen here to the north, 28 seen to the south. Each parcel became part of a lot within a plan of subdivision and thus lost their Planning Act protections from a merger on title granted under section 50 subsection three when a new lot was created to the west under consent application D037047 in 2008. When the lots merged on title, they continue to function independently of one another and are separated by a fence, seen here, and a hedge. Again, shown here is the, uh, the survey of the subject properties showing the proposed decreased lot frontages as a result of the new lot configuration. Again, here, um, these are pictures taken of the, the front yards of the subject lands, 26 and 28 respectively. This is facing, this would be facing westward uh, with Pickerel Point Road to the south. So again, just showcasing the, the front yards, the existing front yards, you can see a swale here of the subject property. Um, there's me in the, uh, in the background. Um, this is taken facing north to um, along Sander Lane Court, um, just north of Pickerel Point Road. So, Actually, I'll go back to this slide for a minute. The, the subject property is part of a smaller plan of subdiv subdivision surrounded by agricultural uses. The application will serve again to reestablish independent ownership over the single detached dwellings addressed as 26 and 28 Sanderling Court, respectively. The lots merged on title and they continue to function independent of one another and again are separated by a fence and a hedge. As each side of the subject property is developed with the dwelling, the perceived frontage is not changing as a result of the application. Further, the frontages proposed um, are in keeping with the other residential lots along Sanderling Court. So this photo is taken just showcasing the, the rear yard. Uh, you can see the hedge in the background. So this hedge is separating 26 and 28. Um, again, just showcasing the rear yard, the rear yard slopes actually considerably to the west as, as you traverse that way. So this is taken again in the rear yard showcasing 28 um, Sanderling here up on the hill. Again, on the opposite side is 26 the hedge that was in question separating. 
Um, for the proposed interior side yard setback reduction from the dwelling at 26 Sandra Lane Court to the mutual lot line, sufficient space remains for access and maintenance purposes. Also, it's not anticipated that the 0.3 meter reduction from one corner of the dwelling will be perceptible. As the attached garages of each dwelling border the proposed mutual lot line and the relief is being requested for the corner containing the garage, there is no anticipated loss of privacy as the closest wall of each dwelling to the mutual lot line contain the attached garages. Again, shown here, the um, mutual lot line, here is the hedge and fence respectively. The subject properties are zoned uh, rural, well, is zoned rural residential type one within the Township of Fenland zoning bylaw. The intent of the lot frontage provision is to ensure the residential lots are sufficiently sized to accommodate a building along with private servicing. The frontage provision appears to have been written on the premise that a lot within the RR1 zone would be rectangular in nature. The two proposed residential lots to be reestablished are pie shaped. They do contain sufficient area to contain and support two dwellings as is evidenced by the two dwellings that exist. However, the building envelopes are situated further back from the road. The intent of the interior side yard provision is to ensure sufficient spatial separation between lots to manage massing, property maintenance issues, and lot, lot drainage and grading issues. Due to the pie-shaped nature of the lots, only one of the two corners of the dwelling requires relief from the interior side yard provision. It is not anticipated that the 0.3 meter reduction on one corner will be perceptible. Further, there is sufficient distance within the dwelling and the lot line to carry out needed maintenance. And Development Engineering uh, and Engineering Services Division has not raised any issues with respect to lot drainage and grading. And that is the last slide. I just want to point out that comments were received from Development Engineering, the Building and Septic Division, and Community Services, that have, and they have no concerns with the subject application. Um, staff is requesting approval of the subject application and can confirm that the application does meet the poor tests of a minor variance and is requesting approval of the application subject to the conditions found within the report. Thank you. Job well done, Mr. Stanton. Thank you. All right, committee, any questions of the planner? Ms. Archer, go ahead. Through you, please, to the planner. Um, can you tell me what year the houses were built? Oof. Uh, through you, Mr. Chair, just give me one second and I may be able to. I know it was part of that subdivision and they are relatively indicative of maybe the late 70s perhaps the owner would actually who is online would be better no, able to answer that question i was just concerned because it looks like the lots at the back it, it looked like these two had to merge in order that they were granted the severance at the back side is but the houses were already there i i believe that agricultural lot yes i believe so i believe you're correct so we would be in effect be reversing the requirement that allowed them to have the other severance the lots one and one and uh, parts one and three were severed from the residential areas and then they were required to merge so that they would only have one lot and we'd be reversing that i just give me a second to take a look in here um, perhaps the applicant may be better able to answer that question, but uh, just give me one second and I might be able to find the answer for you. Thank we'll, you. We'll get to the applicant in a minute. We'll deal with the planner right I now. I do. I, oh, sorry, Mr. Chair. Actually, I believe this was part of, um, part of a, a plan of subdivision originally and that they have essentially inadvertently merged um, due to legal purposes. I believe there was purchasing. Uh, the one owner purchased... Uh, purchased both lots in the same name and they essentially merged on title. So I don't think the severance, now that I think about it, has anything to do with the plan of subdivision. But doesn't a, a plan of subdivision, it doesn't make a difference if you own them side by side. They're legally separate in a plan of subdivision. Note that, sorry, th through you, Mr. Chair, because they, um, because they were both in the same name on title, 
they merged with respect to the um, with respect to the land registry, right? Not when they're legal plans of subdivision, I don't believe. Um, perhaps the um, manager of planning can answer this question. Thank Mr. you, Mr. Holly. Thank you through the uh, through the chair. I believe that the lot that came off here wasn't, I think was part of these two lots. And I'm wondering if that merged it or not. Well, from the, it sounded like they were, it was a deeming a merger on title. I don't understand what that means. It just sounded like in order to, to get that severance, they had to put those two in the same name. And now they're wanting us to actually change that yeah i don't think i don't think approving this application will have it have any sort of an issue on on any other lots this is the application that's before us here today is to deal with this this legal issue it's actually fairly prevalent we're dealing with another one um right now as well on uh, on another lake um two lots side by side in a subdivision and uh both registered in the same name and um, it's a planning act merger, so. Well, yeah, we're probably dealing with two separate owners here too, are we not? The uh, the applicants are online and they can provide the history. I I, I see um, Mr. Brazier and, and Ms. Henry here that they could probably better answer the question than I can right now. Right, well, we'll just hold off on them until we find out if there's. Yeah. So Ms. Archer, if you just hold all that until we uh, get to the applicant. Are there any further questions of the planner by committee members? All right, that was simple enough. All right, then uh, the applicant is there. Uh, okay, uh, would you state your name, please? Chris Henry. All right, you, uh, you've heard the, perhaps Ms. Archer, you could uh, rephrase it for the applicant, your question. Well, I was just interested in knowing when the houses were built and when the back parts of the uh, properties were severed off? Um, I believe the houses were built in the late 70s. And the back part, when we severed the lot, was 2011, I believe. So we took part of 26 Sanderling, part of 28 Sanderling, we, and merged a lot together. The lawyer, had told us that one house had to go in Teresa Henry, Kevin Brazier, the other house, Kevin Brazier, Teresa Henry. And the lot had to be in one individual name, which is Kevin Brazier. So we've had three separate tax bills. We've been paying on three separate pieces of property. And then a couple of years ago, we found out that 26 and 28 had merged together on title. So we just want them separated back to what we thought we had initially. Thank you. Okay. Any, f any f further questions from committee to the applicant? All right, uh, to the applicant, did you wish to speak to the uh, application? No, no, <laughs> but thank you for your time. <laughs> and thank you for taking the time as well. All right. Is there anyone online wishing to speak in support of this application, in support of the application? Anyone online wishing to speak in opposition to this application, opposition to the application? All right, being none, back to committee. What is your pleasure? Councillor Yo? As printed. Do I have a seconder? Do I have a second there? Mr. Richardson. All right. Any further comments or questions with respect to the motion on the floor? All right, being none. Councilor Yo. In favor. Mr. Richardson. In favor. Ms. Archer. In favor. Mr. Strangway. In favor. And I'm in favor. Your application is approved. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, question, Mr. Hawley. Um, 
Are you prepared to present your overview today, now? I am, yes. All right, so what I would suggest, if we can, uh, given our technology, can we take five, uh, Joel? All right, let's take five.
All right, uh, if uh, you're ready to go, uh, Richard, and we're all back online apparently, so um, it's, uh, it's all up to you, uh, Mr. Holly. All right, perfect, thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. So these are, we've got a couple of uh, small, short presentations lined up for you um, on additional residential units and implementation overview, and uh, as well as source water protection. Uh, so Leah, Leah Berry, who is our acting manager of planning as well as our policy supervisor had, um, had made these happen last year. Uh, a lot of work went into these and um, you know, so there's, uh, this will hopefully clarify a number of situations. I know that committee has, has often put uh, conditions into their decisions with respect to um, apartments or, or units over top of garages and so on and so forth. So this I think will help with, um, with that sort of overview. Uh, next slide, please. So the uh, so the the goal behind the, uh, the the project was is to basically provide more uh, more affordable rental housing, um, and it uh, but uh, it does allow the existing homeowners to maintain their homes and live in them, and uh, generate some uh, cash from the rental income. So there's sort of two scenarios. One so the PRU is the gray, which is the primary residential unit. So you can have um, an, an expansion of the existing home or a conversion of a portion of the, of the home and, um, um, and an additional residential unit can be either attached to the house or as a separate unit. Uh, so that can either be um, in, in Lindsay, for example, it could be a, sort of a coach house style or in, in the rural areas, it could be, um, it could be a standalone uh, ARU within a garage. Next slide, please. So uh, Bill 108 replaced the uh, second units with, uh, with ARUs. Um, so it's a self-contained uh, self unit within the same building, either, either within the primary residential unit or as an accessory structure uh, on the same lot as the uh, primary residential unit. And um, ARUs are permitted as of right on eligible properties now. Next slide, please. So this just sort of shows you how it how the different scenarios could sort of play play themselves out. Um, so there are a number of different scenarios. One is where you have a um, a, a primary dwelling with an a, with an attached ARU and a separate ARU, so you could get up to three units on one property. Um, <clears throat> in some rural areas, uh, you could have the scenario above plus a, uh, a garden suite, and a garden suite is a, is a temporary uh, situation that is defined through, through a zoning bylaw for that specific property, and would allow that, um, uh, that garden suite to stay at, for a specific length of time. Uh, the final scenario is if you had, uh, for example, a semi-detached uh, type of dwelling, you, each, each side of the um, dwelling could have an ARU as well. There could be uh, an ARU in the backyard as well. Next slide, please. So there were there were quite a few changes, policy and and uh, zoning changes. So we we made changes to all of the official plans that we have. So the city's official plan, the town of Lindsay, the village of Fenlon Falls OP, county of Victoria OP, and that's to deal with uh, some of the urban areas that um, that aren't approved yet through the city's official plan. They're still they're still those policies are still before the tribunal. And finally, for the same reason, the Township of Ops official plan, there are some sections, um, all C sections that are still in a force, in force and effect. So on the north side of uh, North Edge of Lindsay, for example. Also two bylaw amendments were done um, or two bylaw streams were done. One was to all of the 18 zoning bylaws. And then there was one a specific one done to the Oak Ridges Marine zoning bylaw. 
Um, <clears throat> that one has some, some subtle nuances because of the Oak Ridges Marine Protection Plan. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so the differences in application in, in the official plans and zoning bylaws are basically um, urban versus rural. Uh, there's slight differences in, in the servicing policies um, and there may be other requirements such as minimal distance separation requirements, for example, in the rural areas. Um, also farm, uh, farm dwelling uses and garden suites. Those are sort of the main, the main differences also from a servicing perspective, um, there are larger minimum lot size requirements in rural areas as opposed to in urban areas. Um, and it makes it, um, it's sort of, uh, there, there's a number of, of uh, requirements there and I'll get to that later. Um, in the Oak Ridges Moraine, I spoke to the nuance there and accessory residential unit is only allowed within the primary residential unit. So in the Oak Ridges Moraine area, you cannot have that ARU um, as part of a, a detached garage. Next slide, please. So overall, and I think this is kind of the highlight where the committee is really interested in mostly um, uh, development provisions. So uh, ARUs are allowed in single detached dwellings, semi-detached dwellings and townhouse dwellings. Um, and so they're, they're uh, subject then to the, uh, to the urban standards. In rural areas, we have a minimum lot area of 0.4 hectares or uh, one acre, and that's to accommodate a minimum lot size for um, septic, uh, septic provisions, as well as make, ensuring that there's enough room to, to house the ARU and that there's, uh, there's also well separations as well. Otherwise, um, the, uh, the air user then subject to the uh, standard zoning provisions. So basically, as I stated, um, they, in rural areas, they're required to demonstrate well and septic capacity. So interestingly, the ARU can be of equal size or smaller than the primary residential unit. So for example, if you had a 3000 square foot home on your property, you could build a 3,000 square foot, up to 3,000 square foot ARU as well. <clears throat> so um, the individual zoning bylaws will deal with lot frontage, um, lot area, lot frontage, uh, setbacks, coverage, height. And interestingly, in, urban, in an urban context, ARUs are not considered subject to density controls. And the reason for that is because you could build an ARU, but then not use it for a period of time or stop using it altogether. So the province didn't want to make them subject to, to uh, density controls. Um, also, no, ARUs are not subject themselves to parking requirements. But for example, if you had a home occupation within the ARU, that in itself would be subject to parking requirements. So obviously it's, um, it, I think it was a bit contentious that, that the province said no parking requirements for ARUs, but that's, that's a requirement. So uh, there's not much that we can do about that. Um, and they're only allowed on open and maintained roads. So we have a couple of zoning bylaws that allow development on unopened road allowances, that doesn't then allow you to have an ARU as well. Next slide, please. So further, some further development provisions. Um, <clears throat> they're not allowed in buildings that are within in hazard areas, floodplains or water setbacks. So for example, um, there are a lot of existing um, sort of uh, some slight ARUs in boathouses and things like that. It's very clear that they, they can't be within any hazards or close to the waterfront areas or any water setbacks. Um, rural ARUs are subject to MDS setbacks. So if you're in a rural area um, and you are close to a farm, 
that that ARU is subject to an MDS setback to ensure that that additional unit doesn't cause a problem on an adjacent property from a farming perspective. Um, this was important for us um, to ensure that ARUs cannot be severed from the from the lot that has the uh, principal residential unit. That was a concern of ours originally um, because we thought that uh, clever people might, uh, especially if these are in farm uh, in in farming areas, clever people might build them and then try to sever them off, but. Um, they cannot be severed off from the main main residential unit or the lot that holds the main residential unit. Um, ARUs have to comply to uh, the, the Ontario Building Code, Fire Code, Zoning Bylaw, and any other municipal or agency standards. So for example, um, Trent Southern Waterway, KRCA, so on and so forth. Um, the ARUs must also be registered with the city. So we have a registry uh, system that's in place uh, that was put in place through a bylaw and um, they are registered through the uh, uh, through the building division and we have put educational resources on our uh, planning and development web page so that um, so that people can find out what the requirements are and uh, just I, I will say we have had a lot of interest in them so I think it's it was uh, it was it was good that we uh, that we got this done last year. Next slide, please. Yes, yes, Sandra. I'm having trouble unmuting. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, sorry. Um, so is this different than? Uh, permitting living space above a boathouse then? Well, if the boathouse is, if the boathouse is within a, either a floodplain or a water setback or a hazard feature, then no, uh, if for new situations, we won't, we won't approve them there. I was thinking that we'd had a few applications and we were told we couldn't put in a provision that they could not allow, um, Habitable existence above the boathouse, but this is saying the, that so. So sometimes people um, have boathouses outside of that um, water setback area, and they might call it a boathouse. But um, in that case, you can <clears> have <throat> it if it's if it's within a detached uh, garage that is outside of a, a floodplain area or a water setback or a hazard feature then you can have the ARU in the second story. However, if that boathouse is within, is within either one of those three scenarios, then the, the ARU is not permitted in the second story. Okay, thank you. So um, essentially these, these policies and zoning provisions are now in effect. And um, the ARUs are, are being reviewed and registered through the uh, building and, and septic division. Does anybody have any, uh, any questions on that? Any further questions? Just yes, if I may, have... Richard, um, this is all relatively new, I guess, but have we had much in the way of applications so far uh, with anything pertaining to these ARUs? Uh, I know we've had these um, suites, uh, garden suites on lots before and people have applied for permission, but as far as these uh, ARUs generally, have we had much in the way of uh, people inquiring or making applications for? So I can, I can say we've had a lot of interest in it. Um, there was a lot of interest before and that's kind of what, why we wanted to get this initiative uh, finished. And uh, I wanna thank Leah and uh, uh, Leah Berry and Anna Colnina for, for doing that. Um, perhaps Suzanne, uh, have we had a lot in the way of building permit issuances or registrations uh, for ARUs? Um, we, I'm, I'm just trying to look it up here quickly, but we do have, I would say, you know, we average about a dozen to 15 a year over the last several years. There seems to be a lot more interest recently I'm just going to see if I can do a quick count here. 
So it looks like since 2017, when we introduced our new tracking system in for building permits, we've had 65. Okay. Yeah, I guess, yeah. Yeah, go ahead, damn it. Oh, um, good question for Richard. Um, given that it's gonna be allowed uh, in urban areas, what's it gonna do for our servicing capacity? Have we factored that in at all? Uh, so th that was, that's a really good question. There was a lot of debate about that and because essentially this, so there's, there's two factors. One is it's a, it's a requirement of the province that we allow these as of right. So we don't have much of a choice in terms of, uh, in terms of servicing capacity. Yes, they will take some servicing capacity, but because they, they're transitional, which means that they you could have an ARU in an urban area for, for five or 10 years and then decide to not rent it out or sort of get rid of it. They kind of transition in and out from a, a, a capacity perspective. So it's, it's very difficult to track in that sense. Um, but the thing is we, we I mean, the, the good thing is, is that um, the building division is tracking them. So we have an understanding of them, but the issue is they're sort of fluid and it's not like a it's not like a dwelling which is going to stay a dwelling for for a long time they can track in and out so uh we we have to we have to give them service and connections i don't think at the end of the day it's going to use a lot of capacity but it it will use some capacity so just to follow if i could so it's not going to affect our secondary plans and, and the service and capacity numbers on those applicants and stuff i don't think it will from that perspective uh i think what we might do is when we look at um our updating our servicing master plan we're probably going to have to take a look and just put a factor in for aru sort of as a, as a whole and now that suzanne is tracking them we can kind of get an idea percentage wise um you know if you have a if we if we take them as a percentage of of dwellings within a within the urban areas what's the percentage and then we can maybe uh put uh bring something forward from that perspective right okay thank you steve did i see your hand yeah go ahead yeah thanks a lot um a couple of questions first of all follow up on uh councillor yo's uh we had this debate back when i was on council one of the questions that came up are we going to require these units to have their own separate um, water meter? No, it was decided that that wouldn't be a requirement. Uh, when this came to council in 2014, the first round, um, and I can't actually recall why, but there was a discussion and, and it was determined that they wouldn't make them separately meter it. Um, because it would mean bringing in separate services, et cetera. Um, I know recently when we've discussed it, when this new uh, revisions came to the planning policies is that um, the province is intending it to be affordable housing. So the, the more hoops and things you put in front of it, the less affordable it becomes as a, as a product. So, I tend to be the person who jumps on the soapbox and stands up here in this in this group discussion for the uh, housing group because they're not usually in attendance. But um, that is one of the bigger pushes from the province was to keep it affordable. I certainly understand it from that point of view. I think for Emmett had a good point too. Is you know how much additional uh, water are we going to use and so on. The other thing is this appears, am I correct, a real game changer? For years, when people have asked to build garages and so on, say, "Gee, we want to, uh, you know, have storage space above," does this take out of the, out the question? Well, is this storage space or is this living space? Is it just accepted that if people want to put living space above there, they can go ahead and do that? Uh, I guess they can. I guess what differentiates living space from an ARU is that an ARU is a self-contained unit, which means it has sanitary and kitchen facilities as well. And it, 
it would then have the requisite plumbing uh, to go with that, to support that. Um, I mean, living space can be many different things to many different people. It could be, you know, a rec room, it could be a bedroom, or it could just be a kid's hangout room um, with just, you know, lights and, and, and heat in it and not necessarily any, anything else, right? Um, so that, I mean, it's, it's going to depend on the scenario, right? Um, but I suppose if you're going to put that in, then uh, then you might as well consider if you wanted to put something else in then as, as well. Yeah, it, I'm just saying what it appears as now is that somebody wants to build a garage out in a rural area or whatever, yeah, they can certainly go ahead and put an ARU in and with the plumbing and heating and cooking facilities. That's correct. Yeah, as long as they meet the, the zoning requirements, yeah, sure. Definitely. And, and take out a building permit. Yes. And register it. And register it. Yeah. yeah. It's a couple more components. Yes. <laughs> well, that, that, and that's, you know, sorry. Go, go ahead, Lloyd. Uh, yeah, and it's interesting you mentioned that because my, my little mind is whirring here as you speak about we've had a, a number of instances in the past. In fact, that's one of the reasons that we asked that maybe you could attend uh, w uh, was the fact that uh, people are trying are seeking forgiveness rather than permission. And uh, that's my concern, especially out in the rural areas. If this is an attached R ARU to a, to a, a PRU, are they, then they're going to be coupling with the septic system uh, and the well in the rural area, correct? Yes, they have to, um, anytime they, they um, apply for, whether it's a detached or attached or renovation within the existing, um, they have to go through a septic review as well when they're in the rural area. And sometimes that'll be the piece of the puzzle that'll change their mind, right? That they won't go forward. So um, we've been working really hard to get an SOP in place um, that tells each person that's in this puzzle what they need to do. Uh, we've created a really good template within CityWorks to track these now so that my staff are collecting the right information so that I can report back to anyone who needs stats on this. So we, we track whether it's existing because a lot of these numbers that I'm giving you like 65 in the last four years, a good chunk of those are existing uh, units that want to be recognized so that when they sell it for real estate purposes, it's going with clear, um, defined legal status. And so we're not getting a lot of new ones being built. We're more getting some of the old ones recognized. And, and unfortunately, we all know, even in the town of Lindsay, we probably have thousands. And our registration list is I don't know, around 50 units right now. It, it's not very big compared to how many we know are out there. It's just how do we proactively get those? I think we'd have to hire a team to chase them down. The enforcement issue is going to be real interesting because I guess, especially again in the rural areas, if it's a separate, if it's a separate garden suite or a separate ARU, then they may very well be asked to put in a separate uh, septic system, correct? That's a decision that they make when they're doing their planning. So they can propose to increase and extend an existing, replace with a bigger existing, or they do, if they have enough land, they can propose a separate second system. The way the building code looks at septics is that as long as it's on one contained property, not more than 10,000 liters a day, then it falls within the building code. So it doesn't say it has to be one system. It just has to be within the boundaries of one property. So you could have three little systems if you really wanted to, um, but you then t chew up more of your yard. So most people don't want to go that route because then they can't, you know, put a driveway, they can't drive across it. it. It really limits what they can do. They can't put a pool there. So the septic system is usually a really intricate part of, of where people put stuff now when they're looking at these. I don't like playing the devil's advocate, but I can see this is an enforcement nightmare. Oh, my goodness, holy cow. Anyway, any further questions of uh, Suzanne or Richard? All right. Richard, did you want to uh, you source water protection as well? Are you, are you going to do something on that? Sure, I, I, would just, I would just run that through quickly as well. 
Yeah, go ahead. All right, so again, I'd like to thank Leah and uh, Aunt Anna for pulling that together uh, uh, last year. Uh, it, was a, it was a pretty big exercise and um, uh, we had a timeline under the, uh, under the uh, uh, source protection plans to implement our, our um, amendments as well. So we, we met that. So basically in terms of, oh, next slide, please. So basically what the background was um, uh, to source water protection, uh, source water planning in Ontario was the Walkerton tragedy um, and the Walkerton inquiry in the early 2000s. Um, recommendation out of that inquiry led to the uh, Clean Water Act, uh, which then led to source water protection plans, um, <clears throat> which were created um, by 2015. And we had a five-year deadline to implement the, um, the official plan and zoning bylaws uh, for those, which we, uh, we uh, did hit that target. Next slide, please. So in terms of, in terms of uh, responsibility, the, um, it's uh, responsibility, responsibility for enforcing part four of the Clean Water Act is with the risk management official. Um, the city has contracted um, a person at KRCA, Jenna Stevens, as our risk management, management official. And she reviews all of the um, applications that come through um, from the city uh, through within these areas. Um, <clears throat> The protection of municipal drinking water sources by managing significant drinking water threats is basically the, the main aspect of it. And uh, Jenna's role is to comment on municipal pre-consultation applications, um, on uh, conservation authority applications. Uh, she issues section 59 applications. Uh, she negotiates risk management plans and inspects existing risk management plans and does a lot of uh, our education and outreach. And the risk management plans are basically plans that she develops for say, for example, you have an oil tank in a, you're in a source water protection area and you use um, oil to heat your home. Uh, she, uh, she does a, uh, a risk management plan to ensure that uh, any spills from that don't, um, have any impact on, on source water or any, any sort of source water area. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so the, uh, the why for this, um, basically um, our proposed uh, OPA and ZBA uh, were required under the Clean Water Act and uh, was also required as a conformity with provincial policies. There's a lot of policies with respect to source water planning within there, within those policies. Um, and any existing OP policies and schedules um, that we had, we did have some source water planning in our OP, but it was, it was outdated and there was no direction in the zoning bylaws. So we had to go with uh, brand new documents. Uh, so we have incorporated um, policy directions from the source uh, protection plans with respect to identifying key vulnerable areas and any restrictions on future land uses that may be threats. And so these were put into our CKLOP as well as uh, 14 different uh, zoning bylaws. Next slide, please. So the city has uh, 23 uh, key vulnerable areas that are identified through the three uh, source protection plans. We have the South Georgian Bay, South, or sorry, South Georgian Bay Lake Simcoe uh, source protection plan, which is primarily on the western edge of our city. Uh, the, Trent the Trent source protection plan is uh, incorporates the most of our uh, area through CKL, and there's a tiny little sliver. Um, at the very south end, the Ganaraska Source Protection Plan. So those are the three 
uh, the three uh, source protection plans within our area, although there are no key vulnerable areas in the Ganaraska source protection plan. Uh, so key vulnerable areas are wellhead protection areas and intake protection zones. Um, and so they were delineated through a series of reports that were done uh, that used uh, technical and scientific information to determine the length of time for select contaminants to reach a municipal drinking water source if they were released in the environment uh, through either a spill or a leak. So that's basically, in a nutshell, that's sort of the science behind it and how these were uh, created. Um, so wellhead protection areas, they are protection areas around our municipal wells. So for example, Omimi has a municipal well. Uh, so there is there is a wellhead protection area around that. And intake protection zones are uh, where we have water intakes within uh, water bodies. So for example, Lindsay has an intake protection zone because we pull water out of the uh, Ski Glove River for our drinking water system. Next slide, please. So this is a this is a slide that sort of shows you what a wellhead protection area looks like. Uh, so these are sort of drawn around based on that science. They're drawn around um, the different well areas that we have. <clears throat> and again, they sort of the different colors show the length of time uh, that it takes uh, for contaminants to to travel uh, through the soil in there. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just an example of, of what it what this sort of looks like on the, the mapping that was produced for the city. Uh, so you can see you can see the different the different circles as well as the different um, wellhead protection zones. And again, that's just the length of time that contaminants take uh, to travel underground if there was a spill. Uh, to get to that, um, in this case, it's a wellhead protection area. And the, the zoning map on the right shows basically the, the area that how we've treated it in the zoning bylaw. So what we've done is we've just put an overlay over top of the zoned areas and they basically are, that's essentially the extent of the overall wellhead protection area. And that's how we've shown it um, in the zoning, in our zoning bylaw. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so, and, and uh, so this, for example, this is Lindsay, this is the intake protection zone. So this gives you an idea of what it, um, of what it looks like. So there, there are, um, there's a combination of areas uh, within the river that, that are protected. Um, as well as, as how, um, I guess, surface drainage or runoff could also impact the intake protection zone as well. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So again, this shows, this shows the map within the, uh, on the left is the map that, uh, that's sort of the technical maps that we have. And on the right, uh, shows what the uh, zoning overlay looks like. So again, it's it's a hatched area that's basically the same uh, the same size as the overall uh, intake protection zone as well. Next slide, please. So, with respect to threats, the Clean Water Act prescribes twenty two activities as drinking water threats. Um, so the, the source protection plans uh, require that land use activities consider uh, considered a future drinking uh, water threat be prohibited um, on the properties that are identified and the, the official plan and zoning bylaw lists all of these and to ensure that those types of uses are not permitted uh, within those areas. So for example, some of the threats would be waste disposal sites. So any type of waste, either either municipal or private, uh, commercial fertilizer storage, uh, pesticides, road salt, 
um, bulk fuels, manure, biosolids, and uh, snow storage. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So you may have seen some of these signs around. This is, um, these, ba these signs are basically uh, at sort of the edge of um, drinking water protection zones, just to sort of give the public an idea of, uh, of sort of the, the extent of these, uh, these intake protection zones or drinking water protection zones, uh, so that they, they have a, a better appreciation of, of, um, of source protection planning. Next slide, please. Again, um, this, uh, the, the, the zoning, we treat this as an overlay. Source protection planning is treated as an overlay. It doesn't affect the zoning on your property. However, it may affect the use somewhat on the property to curtail some of these uses. Basically, if, if, if some of these if you're, you have used some of these or, or going to try to use some of these uh, uses that were identified before, uh, you couldn't use them uh, on the property now. So there is a bit of a, an exemption for uh, small household act uses or activities. So if you're going to store some fuel for your uh, lawnmower, that's, that's fine. And if you're going to have some salt to uh, salt your front steps or your uh, driveway or have some paint in your property, um, <clears throat> then, uh, then that's, that's acceptable. Um, and a section 59 notice is required as part of a complete planning application or building permit application. So say for example, a developer has a piece of property and it's contained, for example, it, let's just use the Lindsay, the Lindsay example. You're going to redevelop a property that's within that intake protection zone area. Uh, you have to go to the risk management official and you have to outline what uses you want to have on the property. And if there aren't any problems, she will give you a section, uh, section 59 notice to say that what you're proposing to do is acceptable. And you basically, at every step of the process, you have to get a, a notice all the way, uh, a section 59 notice all the way to a building permit. Next slide, please. So all properties are screened uh, to determine uh, location within a vulnerable area. So that's obviously um, what is being done and that's why these zoning uh, maps are, are very important. So if someone wants to do something, we have to let them know about uh, the fact that they may be in a, uh, an intake protection zone or a wellhead protection area uh, so that we provide them with guidance so that they go to the um, RMO. The applicant, if they're within one of these areas, they're referred to the uh, risk management official for, for guidance and they complete an application and return it to the RMO, which is then reviewed. <clears throat> and if, if everything is okay, um, then then a, a notice is, uh, is issued if it poses no risk or a section 58 applies, but a risk management plan has been established to address a, a significant uh, drinking water threat. Um, so the RMO notifies the applicant of the status of the application within five business days. So it's, it's meant to be a fairly quick process. And I know that, um, I know that Jenna uh, seems to turn these around very quickly. So I, you know, the process from that perspective uh, is, is working quite well. Next slide, please. So again, uh, the official plan policies and zoning provisions were approved by council um, uh, November of last year, and they are now in effect. And whenever, uh, whenever we have uh, someone um, within one of these uh, areas, we advise them um, of these policies and of these, uh, of these requirements. Does anybody have any questions? That was a long presentation. Um, does anybody have any questions? Any questions from anyone? 
Yeah, go ahead. I have some okay, go ahead, Emmett. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, sorry, I was just gonna, so this has been around for, for a lot of years to source protection areas. So I know you just explained it all, like, but is anything you explained new? Or is, is was it just the um, Court of Conservation doing it before and we weren't focused on it, so? Well, we had, so yes, you're right. It's been around since I believe 2015 and we've been implementing it uh, sort of administratively uh, but uh, Kawartha Conservation has had their, their RMO in place uh, for some time okay. uh, dealing with this. Yeah. Okay. If I can just, before I go to Suzanne, just to follow up on that, um, I, was, I sat on the board of directors for the Conservation Authority when this came in. And, uh, oh my goodness, uh, a lot of the initiatives that were being considered at the time, and I was gone before any sort of um, concrete uh, decisions came out of that, but some of the initiatives that uh, were identified, oh my God, uh, were just astronomical costs. Now, it's a slam dunk that we all want clean water, obviously, but uh, some of the initiatives uh, were just totally uh, astronomical cost-wise. So my question is, we've contracted the Conservation Authority to manage this. Do they have absolute authority and or jurisdiction and authority or they've got to come back to council, I'm assuming, with any sort of recommendations? No, under the under the legislation they have they have the authority to to deal with the uh, to, to deal with the threats. That the risk management official does have that does have that authority. It doesn't go back to council. So any recommend so any thoughts they have uh, from the conservation authority perspective become law well it's so what they're they i mean there's a there's a prescribed process that they have to follow um and it's i mean it's it's fairly it's fairly tight i mean they can't just they can't add things to it or anything like that it's fair it's it's a fairly prescribed process and set of threats that they're that they're screening for um with respect to the risk management plans, um, I'm not uh, I'm not that familiar with with what goes into those, but um, there's there's a lot of them that that are for agriculture, um, and there's there I know there's quite a few of them with uh, with fuel oil. Uh, Jenna has uh, Jenna Stevens has mentioned that to us, but um, I mean they they have to work within certain parameters as well. So I think there's the there is a check and balance there. Okay, but just so I understand, we the City of Quartha Lakes has contracted the situation to Conservation Authority. They take that as a separate entity, and uh, and they don't have to come back to Council to say we recommend that you do this or you do that. They have the absolute authority to make those decisions. Yes, they do. Yeah. All right, Suzanne. Oh, I'm. Uh, yeah, I think. Uh, Suzanne was ahead of you there, uh, Steve. So go ahead. I was just going to add to it. Um, the so the building department has been dealing with source water protection since 2015. So under the Building Code Act, we are regulated, and we have to do the septic approvals for anything within those source protection areas. So we have, I think it's approximately 2,500 properties that are within the wellhead protection areas and the surface water protection areas. So over a five-year cycle and forever, we have to do this. Every five years, you have to touch each one of those. So we do, we try to do about a, a quarter of them every year with the fifth year as kind of like our buffer. We lost last year because of COVID. We just didn't do them. We didn't think the, the environment was correct to be going out and bugging people when they were stressed out about COVID. We're going to try and pick it back up this year. Um, so that's where that fifth year buffer came in handy for us because we're a little bit behind, but we're going to hopefully get caught up again. So we go out and do those um, every year. And something that's really new and exciting is that with our GIS team, they've created an interactive public mapping link for us. And I just was, while we were listening to Richard, I bugged um, our communications people to, approve my page on the website because I was waiting. I was in, in the queue to be approved. So now the public can go on to our page. They can go into the interactive map. They can type in their property and find out if they're regulated within that wellhead area. And so then that'll 
inform them as to whether or not they have to do something else before they get a building permit, a planning application, or whether they need to have an inspection of their septic system. So I'm gonna it's, check it's my quite notes a lot in my life. <laughs> I'm going to have to check my notes because I thought they left the uh, beer store and liquor stores open to relieve all that COVID stress, but maybe not. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay, Steve, go ahead. Thanks a lot, Lloyd. I, I guess my question is, I'm a real supporter of uh, search water protection through uh, my involvement with Lake Simcoe. Uh, having the presentation here today, the question is, what are the implications for the Committee of Adjustment? Why do we need to be aware of this? And what do you see as those implications? I think I... I mean, obviously, if there if there is uh, if we ever were to process a minor variance within within one of these areas or a consent, obviously they they would have to have a section fifty nine notice uh, as well before we proceed with the application. I think it's just I'm just we're bringing this to you as as a bit of uh, awareness and education, um, just to sort of understand, especially with the ARUs. I know that's been that's been top of mind, but. I thought because we had recently done this, um, just to bring it to your attention, um, because I mean, I'm not aware that we, in recent history, memory that we've done a, a committee of adjustment application within a source protection area, but just in case that it, that it did come forward so that you sort of understood some of the background and um, basically for your, for your own benefit. And understanding so not so much around the decision making but more around the information reports that would come forward if an application was within a source water protection area that's correct um, I mean I'm not sure that um, that variances would necessarily be impacted from that perspective I think it deals kind of more on the use side of things um, and it, in the end, it, it may not, it may not affect, uh, especially residential variances that much because there are the exemptions for residential uses anyways. So it's unlikely to affect um, residential minor variances. Say for example, yes. for additional lot yeah. coverage and so on and so forth. Suzanne, go ahead. Right. Um, just something to add there, and, and this is something we've added to our website page as well, is that the um, RMO at the very onset of this gave us a short list for the building department to use. So we weren't sending people unnecessarily to the conservation authority. So if you're doing a deck, a gazebo, a pool, interior renovations, or putting in a new septic, we don't have to send them for a section 59 notice, even if they're within that area. So I guess potentially you could be looking at a minor variance for a deck or a gazebo, and it could be, or a pool even, and it could be within the area, but they don't require their section 59 notice. So there's going to be, yeah, the odd thing that's exempt. Thanks. Kent, you had, you wish to say something there? Yeah, Suzanne actually just answered my question in that there are certain exemptions to the act, um, in particular things that we deal with like decks and um, gazebos and pools that, that are often triggering variances that that are actually exempt and don't require section 59 notices so suzanne basically took my question or, or my point uh, right out of my mouth so steve you had a further there no i'm good thanks lloyd i think richard probably hit it right on the head that's where i would be coming from is that there i, I never have a problem with just being aware and cognizant of the fact that these things are around they may not directly impact us they may directly impact us but it's just uh, having a, uh, a knowledge or an awareness that uh, they are floating around out there. And of course, the ARUs are a big part of, uh, of what this committee does. So it's, uh, it's all good stuff. Anything further of, uh, of Richard? Well, I think I can speak on behalf of the committee, Richard. Very informative, I think, uh, w well done. Um, it opens our eyes a little bit more as to uh, what is actually going on. Um, generally around so uh yeah n nothing wrong with a bit of education All right Un anything else anyone any so no? i would i would just like to um i would just like to let committee know that um 
with uh, Chris Marshall's uh, departure, I have been uh, appointed as acting director. And um, as a result of that, uh, Leah Berry has become the acting manager of planning. Um, unfortunately, there's, there's other uh, duties and, and, uh, and committee meetings and council now that I have to attend. So I'd be handing the reins over from committee adjustment over to uh, Leah. She has definitely uh, got lots of experience and I think will uh, we'll, um, <clears throat> provide, provide the, the, the great guidance that, uh, and uh, advice that, uh, that you need. So um, she will be uh, attending the next committee meeting. Uh, so I will step back from the, from the Committee of Adjustment. So it's been great being here. So thank you very much. Okay, Leah, what have you got to say? Mr. Chair, there was a reason I had my video turned off. Uh, Richard flatters me. Um, I'm very excited to uh, start taking part more regularly in your committee meetings. Um, you might recall that I stepped in on occasion um, already in my tenure uh, with the city in my previous life as a development planner in another area. Actually, uh, speaking of source water protection in Walkerton, um, my development practice started in Bruce County. Um, I spent uh, quite a number of years, 15 or so, with the Committee of Adjustment. So um, really looking forward to picking that back up and um, having this opportunity for additional uh, engagement with you, um, not just on the development applications piece, but also on the uh, chatting all things planning piece as well. Thank you. Oh, and I recall uh, situations where you did uh, fill in uh, with the Committee of Adjustment and a job well done. So uh, looking forward to, uh, to working with you on the, uh, on the committee. And I guess to both of you, and I mentioned it earlier, but uh, we wish you the very, very best in your future endeavors. So uh, all the best. Anything yeah. else from anyone under other business? All right. Well, that being the case, as you know, uh, you have already um, provided your signatures to um, Charlotte with respect to uh, these applications. And we also appreciate the forwarding of those blank checks. Uh, they'll be most helpful. And uh, <laughs> they didn't get it, I don't think, did they? <laughs> Sorry, we we'll spin. It doesn't it. matter. We'll just go ahead and spin. Thank you very much for that. Somebody, somebody uh, said that to you, Lloyd. He'd have a heart attack. <laughs> yeah. All right. Can I get a motion to adjourn? Councilor Yo, uh, Ms. Archer. And uh, let's see. A show of hands, I think, will do for this one. All those in favor, and that carries. Thank you very much. See you next meeting, if not before. Thanks, Lloyd. Take Th care, and everyone. thank you, Richard. I'll tell you, th this went off very well, considering the fact it's our first time with this setup. So uh, much appreciated to you and staff uh, and committee for your patience as well. So, because uh, I got a feeling we may be doing this for a bit. I see the numbers today in the province. We're pushing 5,000, I think. So. Uh, it's getting pretty scary. In yeah, everyone, I take care. There will, a, there will be a few more virtual meetings, I'm sure. So What's, I'm glad, and I'm glad that it's worked out well. Yeah, it went off like a well-oiled machine, so no problems. Anyway, Thanks everyone, take care. Stay safe. Thank you.